right. So let's make this a little bit larger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the review for Biology 151. Make this larger. Too large. Something like that. All right. So I'm going to hand this over to you. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit off you, just just kind of scrolling to try to keep up. Our page numbers are not going to be the same, though. So okay. just try to keep it to a topic. All right, everybody. Well, welcome. We've come this far. We've made it. Don't worry. Um, so at this point, this is the, I'm telling you what I have already told you. So I'm going to be going through this kind of auctioneer style. If I don't go through it auctioneer style, we're going to be here for five hours. I'm going to try to do it between two or so. So if you have a question, stop me. Otherwise, keep going right on through, jot notes down. If you're having a hard time keeping up, remember it is all recorded and you'll be able to go through it later on 0.7 speed or whatever and slow me down if you need. All right, um, so here we go. This is the study guide. It's gonna be up on Canvas under the most recent announcement. And it's gonna cover um, all three chapters. So the first chapter is a gross introduction, talking about what anatomy and physiology was, talked about the organization of the body, all the characteristics that are shared by living things. And then we talked about homeostasis, which by now you all know is like my favorite word, right? Um, so we talked about the different types of anatomy. We have 11 different subsets of the human body, 11 different organ systems that we talked about. Um, but first, before that, we also talked about how we had these increasing in structural complexity that occurred as we go from one set to the next to the next. So when we start with atoms and make the molecules, we get more complex, right? And then the molecules become cells, cells become tissues, et cetera. So this is like every time taking a series of Legos and making a castle. Um, so you have more than just the Legos that are in the castle. You have all the art and design and the three-dimensional structure, right? So as we go forward, each level can get a little bit more than the previous level until we get to the organism level where obviously the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, and then the next lecture, we talked all about atoms, so atoms being the smallest unit of matter uh, and how they are going to interact with each other to make molecular reactions. We talked about cells being the very smallest um, organism that we call life, right? The functional unit of life. And we talked about different types of tissues. Where we'll talk about different types of tissues in chapter four, so we just kind of gross, or like a gross anatomy, talked about tissues. Um, then, then we talked about how tissues have different types of functions and they are organized by cells and they are going to then comprise organs, which are going to then comprise organ systems and organisms. Okay, we have 11 systems of the human body. We went over each one of them in auctioneer style, but don't worry because we are, each one of them is going to get their own chapter later on. So um, the 11 different systems of the integumentary, that's your skin, hair, and nails, skeletal, right, which holds your bones, that holds your body up. Uh, skeletal, muscular, and nervous all work together for coordinated motion, right, so voluntary motion. We also have our endocrine system, that's glandular secretions, hormonal um, regulation, et cetera, anything that gets into your bloodstream and circulates around. Um, also cardiovascular system, so that's gonna be circulation of our blood, which goes hand in hand. With the respiratory system, we also have lymphatic system, which is going to also kind of work with the cardiovascular system by picking up excess fluid that was delivered by the cardiovascular system in the form of capillary leakage to be able to get that nutrients out to the cells. Um, so the lymphatic system is going to pick up all the rest of that and then filter it through the lymph nodes, which are kind of like little buffets for these organisms to be devoured in until the fluid is cleaned and then sent back into the blood supply. We also talked about the digestive system where we're going to put food into our body and then turn it into the biomolecules that it originally was, so break it all the way down and then absorb it across the intestinal lining. And then the urinary system, which serves to help filter our bloodstream and eliminate any toxic waste through our urine, right? Um, and then reproductive organs, which obviously serves to be able to create a completely genetically unique new organism um, through sexual reproduction. Let's see. Um, so the things that life needs to be considered alive, right? They have chemical processes, responsiveness, motion, growth differentiation, and the ability to reproduce. So metabolism is gonna take all of the chemical processes within our body, which we'll talk about when we get to the next chapter, um, all the processes within our body that are both catabolic or anabolic. Remember, right? anabolic, I think anabolic steroids pump you up, right? And cat steroids, kind of like naughty, will knock things off the counter, maybe break things. So anabolic pathways are going to be building things up, building up molecules. Catabolic pathways are breaking larger molecules down into smaller molecules, like during the process of digestion. But these two processes together, cumulatively, are going to be metabolism, right? Um, all right, we talked about responsiveness. Even something like a bacteria will grow towards growth in a medium or plants towards sunlight. So just being able to respond to your external environment and interact with it. So not just being present, but actually interacting with as well as feeding. So being able to bring in stuff, which is part of the metabolism. 
Um, growth obviously means that you're getting larger and larger in cell size and in complexity. Oftentimes, it's not just the cell that's growing, although the cells do get larger, eukaryotic cells are larger. But typically, we're going to become multicellular as well um, because there's a limitation on how large the one cell can get. So it's easier for the cell to be able to become two and then four and stay within cell sizes. And then we can end up with different sets of cells, which brings us to differentiation. So cells that have different cell types, like neurons versus muscles versus bone tissue, when we end up with a multicellular organism. And then finally, reproduction, obviously creating either new cells or in the process of mitosis, they've cut yourself and you're repairing yourself, or meiosis or the process of creating sex cells to be able to create offspring. Okay, and the last one there just talks about an autopsy is, which is what we do to confirm the cause of death. This is a overview of a feedback loop. We're gonna see dozens of feedback loops throughout the semester. This is just kind of a very broad feedback loop without any specifics, but we're gonna see this exact thing with details that are gonna change many different times throughout the semester. So it's kind of a blank template. Basically, a feedback loop is so we can maintain homeostasis. So like temperature, right? If we go too low in temperature, we're gonna to wanna to go back up. If we go too high in temperature, we're gonna to go back down, right? So internally, we have ways that we detect controlled conditions. So whatever the controlled condition is, we have a way to measure it. We have a baroreceptor that measures up what our pressure, for example, right? Chemoreceptors measure the amount of whatever chemical we're talking about, magnesium, calcium, yada, yada. Um, Osmolar receptors talk about um, the osmolarity and discuss the, the viscosity of the blood. So there's a lot of different types of receptors. In fact, you name it, there's a receptor for it. And when it, something gets out of line, right, so some sort of stimulus is going to disrupt a controlled condition, so we're going to get too hot or too cold or whatever, right? And there will be a specific when we give you the specific analogy. And that's going to disrupt whatever the controlled condition is, which is detected by whatever that receptor is. A baroreceptor detects a change in blood pressure, for example. That's gonna send information to a control center. 99 times out of 100, this is gonna be the brain. Sometimes it's like other effector cells, like hormonal regulation, but typically it's gonna be a control center somewhere in the brain that is going to regulate an effector somehow downstream to help bring this condition back to normal. So there's a response that happens when that effector is told to change however it is that's going to alter the control condition to help us bring back to homeostasis. This is equal to the air conditioner kicking on to bring the temperature in the room back down, right? So if we have high blood pressure, for example, we notice that we have an increased blood pressure, the receptors say, hey, your blood pressure is higher. So a control center in the brain is gonna change things about the vascular diameter, right? If we dilate a little bit, the blood pressure will come down. Right, and other things too, but you see what I mean? So there's like the ability to make sure that we're regulating whatever that control condition is so that we don't get too far out of normal. And again, you will see this 100 times throughout the semester and next. Okay, so there are multiple different types of blood and bodily fluids. Remember, blood is gonna be a connective tissue that's objective is to deliver oxygen to the tissues and to remove carbon dioxide. There's other things to use, circulating hormones, et cetera, it's like a circulating system, obviously. But it also is specifically for delivering the nutrients and taking out the rubbish from every cell in the body, okay? Now, that fluid is going to interact with the extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid is what bathes all of the cells, also called the interstitial fluid. And that, so it's gonna leak out of the blood supply into the interstitial fluid from the capillaries, it's kind of leaky. And then that extracellular fluid is what bathes the cell, so there's an interaction between the intracellular fluid inside and the extracellular fluid. And that's kind of what happens is the fact that there's a gradient between these two, it means it's flowing from, the groceries are flowing out of the bloodstream into the extracellular fluid, into the intracellular fluid, trash is flowing out of the intracellular fluid into the extracellular fluid into the blood supply, right? So that's what's happening here. So again, we have three major sets of body fluid. We have intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is also gonna be considered blood plasma. Basically, is it inside the cell or not? And there's two different locations that it could be outside of the cell, bathing the cell and in the um, inside of the blood vessels, okay? And this fluid exchange is how all of our metabolic pathways get met, right? That's how we bring in anything that we need and expel anything that is toxic to the cell. Okay, so how do homeostasis, how does homeostatic conditions, are they maintained, right? Um, control of homeostasis happens because of receptors that are able to detect changes in that controlled condition and then are able to mediate an effector by way of going through the brain or whatever. So there's a general system here where we have a cycle of events, so information that comes in about whatever that condition is is used to control that condition so that nothing gets too far out of its regular parameters. Right, and again, the control center is almost always the brain. The receptor is, just specific, is specific to whatever we're monitoring. And the effector is whatever is going to be making the change. Now this varies depending on what we're talking about. So we're talking about blood pressure, we can vasodilate or vasoconstrict to change it, right? If we're talking about sugar levels, we can add more insulin or pull more glucose, um, we can pull more glycogen out of our liver to create more sugar. So there's a lot of different ways that we can regulate whatever the pathway is 
So depending on what goes wrong, the effector is going to probably be very different. But almost always the control center is the brain, and there's some sort of receptor that tells it's a tattle, that tells the brain, hey, we're too far out of whack. Okay? Now, almost all of the time we're going to be dealing with a negative feedback system like the one I just talked about. Very, very, very infrequently are we going to be dealing with a positive feedback loop, which is meant to change a system that is out of normal. There's a baby that needs to be expelled. So we are going to have a feed forward mechanism where we're going to contract. That contraction is going to cause stretching. That stretching is going to cause contraction. Contraction causes stretching, et cetera, et cetera, until we have an end in the system. Right? So positive feedback loop is used for a short period of time to expel a fetus or to get rid of a splinter, something that is not a normal condition to return back to homeostasis. Um, so it's a little bit more dramatic than some of the other mechanisms which are going to be bringing it back down. So it's kind of like saying, oh, it's too hot in here, let's set the house on fire, that'll cool it down. Right? Um, but that's really kind of how it works in order to be able to get to that control condition to end where we have expelled the fetus, for example. So positive feedback loops are kind of unique because they feed forward instead of tampering things back. We have, oh, just kidding. Oh. Um, so negative is ne negative feedback loops are like determined if it's like if there's like a change in your body that's like more long term, then that's when the negative feedback loop. Um, negative feedback loops are constant. They're anytime you get out of your regular parameters. So if your parameters are, say, your temperature is supposed to be 72 to 78, if it hits 71, it's too low, the heating kicks on. If it hits 79, it's too high, the air conditioning kicks on, right? It's the same way with like your pH balance. If your pH gets too low, you have a buffer system to bring it back up. If it gets too high, there's a system to bring it back down. Or blood pressure, same thing. If it gets too high, we want to regulate it back to normal. So negative feedback loops are basically saying, you've gone too far, we're bringing you back to the middle. Okay. Whereas a positive feedback loop is like pushing on something, like pushing on a toothache, already make, something that's already bad, you're making it worse, or seemingly making it worse, but that's because there's an end in sight. So there's an end oh, goal, okay. like expelling a fetus. Whereas maintenance, like regular maintenance, is going to be happening all the time, and that's your regular negative feedback loop. Okay. Yep. Um, so here's an example. Actually, it happens to be the example that I just gave. Um, I must have been reading this earlier. Uh, anyway, so the controlled condition here is blood pressure. And when something disrupts the blood pressure, a receptor is going to detect that we have an increase in blood pressure. When that receptor, that bare receptor, like, sets off an alarm, that alarm goes to the brain. In this case, that's the control center, right? Almost always. And the brain's going to send effectors, send output to effectors. In this case, the effectors are going to be the heart. So we're going to decrease our blood rate, like increase our, our pulse, right? Um, and then we're also going to change our blood vessels so that we can dilate them a little bit. So if we make a widen, then we'll end up reducing the pressure inside. So that's going to cause the pressure to decrease, which should hopefully return us back to homeostasis. Right? Um, okay, so yeah. Positive feedback loops are, as I said, very unique. And they are going to try to reach an end state that is not the state that we're in now, like a metamorphosis almost. Basically what happens here, like for, during labor and delivery, the, we have a, a fetus that is pressing against the cervix. So when it presses against the cervix, the cervix stretches because it has pressure against it. And that stretching causes the flood in the brain to affect the muscles of the uterus by releasing um, well, more, basically more enzymes. Right, oxytocin, it's not an enzyme, it's a hormone. It's a hormone that's like a love hormone, but also it's gonna cause more stretching. And that's going to cause um, more contraction. More contraction causes more stretching, causes more contraction, right? Which seems kind of counterintuitive, but that because it's finally forcing out the fetus to reach the end state, which is going to return the controlled condition to normal, right? Um, so it's a, a really dramatic effect. It only happens in extreme conditions, and it's basically, um, forcing forward something that wouldn't normally occur and isn't necessarily healthy for the body to be able to get to the end goal on the other side, right? So this is the classic example of positive feedback loop. It's probably the only one that you're going to see this semester. You might see one more uh, when we talk about inflammation and fever response. Okay, so why is it so important that we maintain homeostasis? If we end up out of homeostasis, it's called homeostatic imbalance, that can cause a disease states, it can lead to death, if you guys have the chance, please take a look at the extra credit assignment that's online. It's called Organ Systems Gone Awry. This is my plug for your extra credit assignment. And basically what it expects you to do is to identify a disease state and talk about how homeostasis was disrupted. Like what went wrong? What's the normal condition in these pathways? What do the organs normally do? And what's the problematic version in this disease state? How does it differ? What are, we, what are our treatment options? How do the other organs pick up the slack? What are the other organ systems doing, yada, yada. So it's not a super long essay, but it is kind of comprehensive and it's gonna allow you to delve into something that maybe has affected someone in your family or something you heard about in the news and it's gonna let you kind of springboard on your own. 
Anyway, um, anyway, that's like the fact of homeostasis. That's one of the little offshoots from that. So disease is a really broad state. Disease can, could mean disorder. It can mean um, so it could be something that you could be living with for forever, or something that could be terminal. So it's um, basically any illness that is characterized by a recognizable set of symptoms. So a set of symptoms that we can say that's usually associated with this disorder, and typically give a timeline for the demise, right? Like what's going to happen next? What are our next stages of this diagnosis? Um, and symptoms are going to be anything that is an abnormal body function, so a disorderly or a body function that is going to be um, not necessarily apparent to observer, like something you might describe, like a headache or a, you know, I don't know, nausea or something like that. You can also have what's called signs, and these are what we can objectively see on an individual. Say they're completely comatose on the street, I can still tell if they have a rash. I can tell they have a fever. So there are certain things that are signs, but if that guy's passed out, I can't tell if he has a headache. Right? So symptoms are something that we talk about, but signs are things that were actually measurable. And so oftentimes people in nurse change those, but as nurses, you're going to be looking for signs and asking the patients to describe their symptoms. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to skip through to the body positions here. We have anatomical positions. This is something that um, we should pretty much all know by now. Basically, I'm sure you went over this in lab as well. Basically, the individual's going to be standing forward, their hands forward. I got my shoulders in alignment there. Um, and we're going to be talking about the different regions of their body from this direction. So regional names are going to be given specifically to the body. And so again, here we go, auctioneer style. If it's of the head, we have the whole head is called cephalic. The skull itself is called cranial. If it's in the front, it's facial. Specifically in the face, we have the frontal region, which is just going to be the forehead. And then we have the temporal, which is over here on the temple. Ocular by the eyes. Um, otic is ear. Um, buccal is cheek. Nasal, nose, um, oral is going to be mouth, mental is chin. Okay, so that's the face. Um, moving down from the arm, so cervical is going to be the neck. Moving down the arm, we're going to have the auxiliary. We're going to see this when we get to the nervous system as well. We're going to see it in the circulatory system. So start recognizing these are regional names of the body that you're going to see over and over again when we talk about where the nerves lie and where the lymphatic system lies, right? Okay, so axillary means the armpit can breaks down into the brachial, that's just the arm, going through the antecubital region, which is the elbow, um, and then we're going to have the antebrachial, that's the forearm, where the radius and the ulna are going to be. Then heading down to the wrist is carpal, right, the carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and then we're heading to the palms, so the palmar region, and then the digits, digital, right? Down the chest, thoracic, abdominal, pelvic. Then we have femoral, where the femur is going to run. And we also are going to have um, the pubic region and the groin. The front part of the leg is called the crural. It's the only one to me that doesn't really make sense. As we head down, we have the tarsal. It's the ankle. Then again, the digital. Um, a pedal just means a whole foot. So if you're looking for like the pedal pulse, for example, you're going to be taking a dorsal pedal, and it's going to be right on the top. Um, from the back, in the top here, scapular is going to be where the scapula is. Scapular is going to be the right scapula is, obviously. Uh, dorsal just means the whole back. Lumbar means the lower back. Gluteal is the buttocks. Um, we also are going to have the papilla, or the perianal, which is going to be like the pubic region or in the back side. Um, and then the sacral is the, the back of the calf. Um, yeah, and then we're going to head down the calcineal. That's the heel. So I think that's everything there. Oh, the plantar is the foot, sorry, and the dorsum is the back of the hand. Okay, other direction terms you need to know. Um, I know the people at home can't quite see me, but I'm pointing directionally, but you can follow the arrows. Arrows, okay, so lateral is going towards the outside, medial is towards the center, right? Um, proximal is closer to the body, distal is further away. It's used to describe the appendages usually, so it's not usually described to the, to the trunk the way that lateral and medial is described to the trunk. Um, also because proximal and distal can be doing this, right? Whereas Lateral and medial are literally just headed outward, whereas proximal and distal have to do with appendages. So it's still going to be distal here and proximal there if it's over your head versus there, but that would be different directions if we were looking at like lateral and medial, which are more referring to like the trunk itself. Let's see. Um, superior is up, inferior is down. Those are all organs that I feel like you should know at this point. So um, I'll skip through that. Let's talk about sections. So we can section you in multiple different ways. If we were to section straight down the middle, like right down the center of your nose, um, that one's going to be a mid-sagittal plane. So, the just, so sagittal just means that you're sectioning this way. But a mid-sagittal plane is directly down the nose. A quarter of the way would be a parasagittal plane, right? Breast, hip, knee, ankle. Um, and that if we had it anywhere else, but it wasn't at the exact half or the quarter line, it would just be called sagittal, right? So if it was like the one-eighth line or over closer to the shoulder, right here making sagittal sections, you'd be cutting this direction. 
Okay, um, transverse, cutting you right through the belly. So if you're making transverse sections, you're slicing this direction upward, which if you were like doing a transverse section through like an MRI, you'd be basically flowing through the body because you'd be looking through those sections at a time. Um, so yeah, transverse Ooh, straight through the gut. your meeting will end in 10 minutes. Uh, okay, we'll have to redo the meeting, sorry. I don't have the, when it does, just let me know, please. Okay. And everyone at back home on the Zoom, you'll just have to re-log into the exact same, um, exact same page, please. All right, so an oblique plane is where I go through in a quarter direction. Any direction that is not a standard direction and an oblique plane will have an angle associated with it. It'll say 45 degree oblique plane, 72 degree oblique plane, right? So you'll know what your direction of this tilt is. Um, oh, the one I missed, frontal pain, is gonna be like taking off your nose. So you're gonna go right through like the face and look basically inward, right? So frontal pain goes right through the front. Okay. Why do we need planes? Why do we need to know what direction we're looking at? Because a lot of times we're looking at a microscope slide, right? Though that just showed you a human, and that's true. Sometimes we will do an entire human. We're doing cross sections through like um, an MRI or something. But most of the time we're looking at a microscope slides. And this is going to be a totally different look than that, than this. And in the early days, we might not even know that we were looking at the same organ, right? If you didn't know what the organs looked like, then you weren't able to say, yeah, that's just the same brain, so it's in a different direction. You might tell me that this is a different organ than that or certainly that maybe it came from a different animal, you wouldn't be able to associate this with the same work that you were doing. And what we want to do across the board in science is make sure that we reach a consensus. So we have to say, I'm looking at it from this angle so that you can also be looking at it from that same perspective to be able to see what's going on, or at least know what the differences were in the perspectives that we're looking at. Okay, there's multiple different sets of cavities inside the body, right? Um, the first cavity that we'll talk about is going to be the cranial cavity. That's going to include the skull, the brain, right, and the spinal column, and all of the fluid within. Um, so that's going to include the vertebral canal, and this is spinal fluid that goes all the way down to the back of the spine. We also have the thoracic cavity. That's going to be our chest. This is where we're going to have our heart and our lungs. Underneath that, we're going to have the, the um, so when it says heart, lungs, pericardial cavity, pleural cavity. Um, also has that media, has that media standard. Um, and then here we have the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity is going to be subdivided into the actual abdom abdomen and then the pelvis as well. This is where we're going to hold our digestive organs as well as our reproductive organs and our bladder, etc. cetera. Um, inside the thoracic cavity, we're going to have different regions. Again, here's the pleural cavity, which is where the, um, where the lungs are going to be. We have the pericardial cavity, which is where the heart is going to be, but remember these organs are not just lining up next to each other. They have a nice pretty lining that they're sitting within. So the lungs sit inside the pleural lining and the heart sits inside the pericardial lining and that's going to allow our protection from friction and other stress as it's constantly rubbing against things around it, right? Rubbing against the rib cage or against the lungs in the case of the heart. So it's basically going to be like a deflated water balloon that has like, some water left in it, and picture your fist being pushed in it, so it wraps around it, and that forms a sac that has a little bit of liquid inside it, so that as it's feeding, the liquid is what's taking the friction instead of rubbing up against the organs next to it. Okay, so if we're taking a transverse plane here, and we're looking through the trunk, um, here we're gonna start looking, this is basically just showing you a transverse plane, we're looking upwards, we have a superior view. Um, sorry, we have an inferior view, we're looking in a superior direction. And so we are in the inferior area. And here we're just gonna see some of the major organs. So there's the heart, got the lungs. We're gonna have the um, aorta and the pulmonary, pulmonary vessels. And here we have the ribs in the front, breastbone, et cetera. So this is showing you where the pleural cavity is. And here surrounding the lungs, we have the pleural cavity. Surrounding the heart, we have the pericardium. And this is just gonna be a small little fluid-filled layer that's going to separate out the different organs so that they're not constantly under frictional stress. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, each one of these has a visceral and a per, um, parietal section. So um, depending on which side it is, if it's closer to the organ or if it's closer to the outside, that's going to be called the visceral or the parietal pleura. Um, the viscera is going to, see, oh, we also have viscera inside the abdominal cavity that's going to go around the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, etc. So anytime you see like um, some sort of lining around the organs, it's typically going to be viscera. Also includes viscera of the pelvic cavity, it can include urinary bladder, etc. There's also membranes that are going to line all of these. So there's a serious membrane that covers that whole viscera. And it's also going to line the thorax and the abdomen. So these are layers that you're going to be going through if you're going to be dealing with abdominal surgery, for example. 
Um, the, again, you have different layers. The parietal layer is going to line the wall of the cavity, and the visceral layer is going to line and adhere within the cavity to the external side. Um, so basically, the parietal is more towards the organ, and visceral is more towards the external surface. And then there's fluid inside called a serous fluid. And we have a ton of these serous membranes. Again, the pleural, the pericardium, the peritoneum is another one. So these are all regions that are going to be serous membranes that are going to surround the organs, including the heart, the lung, and the abdominal cavity. Now, when we're talking about the abdominal cavity, we separate it into several regions or quadrants. And I'm not gonna ask you to memorize where all of these are, but I promise you you'll know where all of these are by the end of this, because we'll be going through where all the organs are. Not by the end of this particular exam, but by the end of these two semesters. Okay, so this is one way that we can start making assessments when someone gives us a symptom, right? Something that they tell us, it hurts here, right? I wouldn't know that it hurts here unless you told me. I mean, I might be able to de demonstrate by like touching that it was hard in that region, but then that would mean that I would be a sign, not a symptom. So a symptom again would be this so-and-so hurts, and you would say where? Does it hurt the top and the bottom and the left and the right, etc.? And by eliminating the quadrants, you could start honing in, maybe not being specific, but honing in on possible disease symptoms, right? Um, Let's see. So it, you would know automatically that, hey, if it's in the lower, right lower quadrant, it might be appendicitis. This might be something we should take more seriously than someone that might have a bladder infection, right? Uh, or a gallbladder, you might take that pretty seriously, too. Let's see. So this talks about different types of medical imaging. So you could get into other subspecialties. You don't all have to become ER nurses, right? Some people are going to become nurses that are going to assist in all sorts of different things, including some of these medical imaging labs. So we have radiography, which is uses x-rays. Almost everybody in here has had an x-ray, right? I'm not allowed to ask, probably most of us, right? X-rays are pretty common. We use that to determine if we have any sort of broken bones. Um, it doesn't really do as much good for soft tissue damage. Now, it does do as good for certain things like cancerous tissue, which we can see the difference between that tissue and normal tissue. But soft tissue damage, we're going to use something different, like an MRI, where we're going to use a bunch of, like, oh, sorry, magnets, magnetic field, basically, to look at the way that our atomic structures line up, which is going to allow us to create an image of the way that our atoms line up, basically. So it's gonna allow us to see soft tissue damage, but um, it's not gonna be very good for bones. So we can also use a uh, CT scan. This is gonna use multiple different sets of x-rays to do dimensional scanning throughout the body. Um, we can also use ultrasound. Anybody who has been pregnant um, or has suffered from any, many of the reproductive disorders will also give you an ultrasound. Um, ultrasounds are gonna be a way that we use sound waves to be able to look at soft tissue. Um, particularly reproductive organs, but we'll use it for other things as well. Um, we'll also use it for guidance sometimes if we're trying to find a problem well, before we actually do a surgery. So we might use that as like a quick and dirty way to see where the problem might be. Do we have fluid buildup here? Is it tissue buildup, et cetera? Um, if we're dealing with the heart, we can have something called CCTA when we're looking at blood vessels that might be blocked. Um, and what basically what happens is they're going to inject a medium inside the body. It's usually going to contain iodine or some sort of barium or something. And it's going to then be able to be imaged by this computer so that you can see what's actually happening. Not just with every heartbeat, because we're going to try to slow the heart down and catch it in between the heartbeats because we want it to not really be moving. But every heartbeat is going to cause the coronary arteries to fill right as well. And so you can see where areas might be blocked, where you might have a nice flow here, but a space here that's missing. Right? In which case, we would have a bypass. Right? We might have a single or double or quadruple would be the worst because there are four of them. That means all of them are suffering. This individual is pretty close to death. Anyway, this is going to be able to be determined by a CCTA, right? so basically a heart scan. Um, we can also do a PET scan. PET scan is going to be using anything that emits positrons. Usually it's radiation, so we'll have you drink something, maybe like sugar or something that's radioactive, to be able to see your inner organs. And the organs that are able to, um, to utilize sugar more rapidly are going to demonstrate this radiation more. So you'll be able to see which organs are going to be physiologically active. Right? Um, endoscopy is something that we use quite often to be able to look inside the body with the camera. We use endoscopy for laparoscopy to do laparoscopic surgeries. We use it for colonoscopy to look inside the colon. We use it as an um, endoscopy to look inside the throat. Right? So we do a lot of different ways though we would just basically send a camera down there to find out either what's going on or to assist us in a surgical maneuver so we don't have to entirely open up the entire knee, for example, right? We can just put a little camera in there, use a little robot to fix the meniscus, 
It's going to be two teeny tiny little holes, not going to be anywhere near the big deal that it used to be when they used to have to take your knee from here to here, pull the whole patella off, pull underneath, go all the way through, right? Now we don't have to go through. We can go in and under with teeny tiny little lasers, basically. And so we use a camera for that, obviously, because we don't do it by feel. We have to see where we are. And so we do that with endoscopy, little miniature cameras. And that's a whole job, the guy that runs the cameras, um, the person. So does the camera have like a little knife on it or something? No, the camera would go aside with the surgical <laughs> instruments, but they are controlled by the same computer, so they move in concert, yes. Can zoom in, Ted. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, please hold, those of you at home. Let me go back to you here. Hello, everyone at home. Hello everyone at home, sorry about the delay. We are back up and running and screen sharing. Okay, great. All right, good, thank you so much. I really appreciate your success. All right, so that brings us to the end of unit one. So we'll just be popping into unit two here, um, talking about organization of matter. We have a lot of chemistry in this. I know it's not going to be our forte unless you're taking biochemistry right now, but we kind of need it so that we can talk about how biomolecules are formed, so how we can talk about how molecules turn into cells, turn into tissues, right? Um, so chemistry is the structure and science of the interaction of matter, basically. So matter is anything that's going to occupy space and has mass, which is different from mass because um, Weight is going to actually, uh, I'm sorry, which is different from weight because weight is going to interact with gravity as well. So your weight will change depending on if you're like on the moon or something because all of us have the chance to get there. Um, but if you go somewhere that has an alternative gravity, you're going to have a different weight, but you're still going to have the same amount of mass because mass is just going to be the amount of substance, basically how much water you displace, right? Um, so matter exists in three forms that we're going to talk about. There's also a fourth form, plasma, that we don't really talk about. Um, we use solid, liquid, and gas, and anybody that's ever boiled water knows how that works, right? So you start, you put ice cubes in the pan, it's going to melt into liquid water, and eventually it's going to get hotter and hotter. Those molecules bounce off of each other, and will eventually become water vapor, right, which is a gas. We have multiple different chemical elements that are going to be the smallest substance that we can utilize of that matter that is going to share the same characteristics. That gets down to an atom, right? So all the elements are going to have specific characteristics that are shared all the way down to the atomic level. When we get smaller than that, we're going to get to the subatomic level. The subatomic letter level, all atoms are, I don't want to say the same, but they're comprised of the same three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. For the purposes of this class, electrons have no weight. Protons and neutrons each have a mass of one. And protons are positive, neutrons neutral, electrons are negative, right? This is where I told that terrible joke about the atom walking into the bar and saying, I lost an electron. The bartender says, are you sure? The atom says, yeah, I'm positive, right? Because you lose, you lose an electron, you become a positive ion. Um, anyway, so these are two different ways that we look at this. The electron cloud model, the electron shell model. Electron cloud is going to incorporate all of these electrons in a three-dimensional space. This kind of looks like a photograph. This is both a video or a time-up. So these are where we would want them to be if we could capture them still, but they're not ever still, they're rotating. And remember, we have multiple shells. The first shell wants two, the second shell wants eight. This one only has four in that outer shell. It has six total, right, it's carbon. So two in the center, but four in that outer shell. What does that mean? It means it can make up to four bonds with other atoms around it, right? It can hold hands in four locations. So that makes it very versatile for things like rings and chains and loops that we're gonna use in our biomolecules. Okay. Again, three subatomic particles, I already went over that. Um, center is going to contain, that's the nucleus, the nucleus is going to contain the protons and the neutrons, and usually the same number of protons and neutrons, unless we have an isotope. And then the electrons are what are going to be kind of reactive to be able to create different bonds. Each shell can hold a maximum amount of electrons, and the idea is to get to that maximum number no more than no less. So if you have one and I have seven, I'm very likely to take one from you. You're happy to give it because you get to go down a shell. Right? But if we have four, well, we might be willing to share it a little bit more than someone like seven and one being one like I would like to take it. So those are two different ways that bonding can occur, right? The ionic and covalent, we'll get to that in a second. But the point being that we have a certain maximum amount of electrons in that outer shell called the valence shell. And you want to be able to fill your valence shell by interacting with other atoms around you. Now, all atoms are electrically neutral to begin with. So that means the number of um, the atoms and, sorry, the number of protons and the number of Electrons should be approximately the same, so we should also have this, not approximately, they should be the same, we should also have the same amount of 
Um, neutrons in this ion here, in this atom here, we don't necessarily, because the protons and electrons are going to be different. And that's going to cause, um, this is a kind of, I almost said it's imaginary, but this is not carbon. This is a different um, atom. And this is going to have what we call an isotope, because we have 17 and 18, so they're not going to line up. Mostly everything is going to have the same amount in the center. Okay. Um, if we have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons, these are going to be called isotopes. So that's what I just showed you. It was an atom that's going to have changed a little bit from others. This is an example of like carbon-14 or whatever. So we do different types of dating where we can look at how old a rock is or how old a dinosaur bone is by the concentration of carbon-12 v carbon-14. Carbon-14 changes from carbon-14 into carbon-12 over time in a certain steady decay called a half-life. Now, we won't actually do the math on it, but that's how we can figure out how old something is by looking at the ratio because how much I have left shows how much is already gone, shows how old the object is approximately. Okay, so we use these um, isotopes to be able to look at radioactive decay, to be able to look at carbon dating and that sort of thing quite often. Okay, um, as I mentioned, the atomic mass, Protons and neutrons each have one, electron has zero. Ignore everything after the decimal. We're not doing any actual hard math here. Um, the atomic mass is also called the atomic weight. And it's going to be all of the inner organs, basically. Remember, electrons are zero. So it's basically going to be neutrons and protons. And neutrons and protons should be equal if we're not dealing with an isotope. So all things being normal, we should have an equal amount, which means that typically the atomic mass is double the atomic number. Right? Atomic number six for carbon, atomic mass of 12 ish because we add all the rest of these up so it becomes a little bit 12 point something something right okay so if an atom is willing to give up one of its electrons or is willing to accept one electron it's going to become an ion right so that atom that just lost an electron and says yeah sure i'm positive it just became a positive ion okay and ionic bonds are going to be when we transfer the electron entirely because i have too many and i want to get rid of it and you have too few and you want to pick it up we don't want to share it, neither one of us, right? However, in the long run, that electron does still belong to me, so when we're going to go our separate ways, when the ionic bond is going to dissolve, the electron's going to go back to its original owner. This was the example I gave in class with the lawnmower, where I have two lawnmowers, my neighbor doesn't have any lawnmowers, I'm just going to let him use my lawnmower. It's still mine, so like if I move or if he moves, it comes back to me, but he can have it indefinitely, mine works just fine, I don't need it, right? So that's going to be the transfer. The other thing I said, like say I had an egg carton, and that egg carton has eggs, and I have seven eggs in my egg carton, and you have an egg carton of eight, and you have one in yours, you might be willing to give me yours so that you can throw your egg carton away and go down the shelf, and I can fill mine up and be happy. So it's kind of like a game where you're constantly trying to trade off your electrons to be able to reach that neutral ground, okay? And that typically only works for atoms that are on opposite sides of the periodic table, like um, sodium and chlorine, right? So one that has seven and wants to pick up one, and one that has one, and wants to get rid of it. Once we start getting to the ones that have two or three, then we're going to start talking about covalent bonds and how we're going to start sharing them. Okay, so again, when we're putting atoms together, we're going to make a molecule, and we have different ways that we can put that molecule together based on what's happening in that outer shell. Okay, um, we did talk about free radicals too. Free radicals are going to cause havoc within a cell because free radicals are going to basically be stealing electrons. So I just talked about ions which are atoms that have given up an electron or gained an electron, and they've done that for a purpose, right? They're at seven and they want to get to eight, they're at one and they want to go down one. Um, so they have done that in like a normal way, but there are some ions that have happened in an abnormal way. These guys are free radicals. They've gained or lost an electron, usually lost an electron, um, in a abnormal way, and so they steal it from someone else. This is me deciding that right now I need a pencil, so I steal her pencil. Well, she needs a pencil, so she steals her pencil, and you steal his pencil. Then you still, you see what it happens. So the next thing you know, everybody's worried about getting their own pencil and nobody's paying attention to class. And it's the same thing with the cellular machinery. It gets completely disrupted because the free radicals just start this cascade of stealing electrons and then none of the biomolecules can perform their actual jobs, right? Um, and that's why you're supposed to take your antioxidants, your cyber, et cetera. It's also why some people age a lot harsher than others, right? So they might be the same age, but they look like they've led a much harsher life. And that's because they aren't taking their antioxidants, they're probably subjecting themselves to things that are going to increase their free radical exposure, like secondary compounds, drugs, um, alcohol, UV light, etc. right? And so all these things enhance the rates of decay because they have faster free radicals or more free radicals. So if you, I'm not saying that a side berry is going to keep you young forever, but if you keep up with your antioxidants, 
then you can help stave off aging and decay. All right, anytime that we have two atoms coming together, it makes a molecule. If we have two atoms of different elements coming together, it's going to become a compound, right? Um, let's see, we have two different types of compounds that we can make. We can make either ionic bonds or covalent bonds. All right, and that all again occurs based on what's happening in that valence shell. We want to get to eight in that valence shell. Side note, hydrogen only wants to get to two, right? But everybody else wants to get to eight. Hydrogen and helium only want to get to two. Okay, so here we have sodium and chlorine. This is back to that example where we have a set of seven eggs in one carton and one egg in the other carton. Or I have an extra lawnmower and my neighbor doesn't have any. So what happens? This guy, sodium, says, I would rather donate this extra electron in this one shell so I can go down the shell entirely and I'll be happy at eight, I'll be stable. Chlorine says, I'll happily take that from you because I'm at seven and that would make me stable. So it'll fill up my space in my garage and you will have the space and you can get downsize your garage. I don't know, whatever, that's a bad example for the lawnmower analogy. But anyway, point being, the electron's going to be transferred to the other atom. This is an ionic bond. And these two are gonna hang out right next to each other because the electron doesn't really wanna go that far. And this one's gonna be positively charged because it's lost an electron. This one's gonna become negatively charged because it has gained an electron. And that's called an ionic bond. Now, ionic bonds are terribly strong until you put them in water, right? And we'll talk about how water being the promiscuous molecule is gonna separate those dance partners on the dance floor, um, but we'll get to that in a second. But my point being that this is a really, really strong bond except that water has partial positive and partial negative charges and five partial positive charges or 10 partial positive charges, whatever, is gonna equal a real positive charge and pour chlorine away. And same thing with the other orientation, all the negative charges are going to pull sodium away. So that's why a tablespoon of salt is gonna dissolve in water. All right, um, ionic compounds are typically gonna be, like I said, solids, right? Like the sodium chloride is a solid, but it's gonna dissolve almost immediately into solution, especially into a water solution. As soon as an ion enters into a water solution, it becomes an electrolyte. We don't call it ion water, we call it electrolyte water, or smart water, or whatever, right? And this is what is basically Gatorade. It's gonna be water that has some sugar in it, but also has a bunch of electrolytes. And what are electrolytes? They're ions. They're just dissociated ions in the liquid solution, okay? Um, let's see. Now, covalent bonds are gonna be stronger in water because covalent bonds are gonna be shared. The first one I'm gonna talk about here is hydrogen. Hydrogen has one in the outside. It wants two. Remember, its valence shell is smaller. It's that first inner shell. It only needs two. And so the hydrogen ions atoms are gonna be able to come together, making a hydrogen molecule here, by having one single bond. The structural formula H2H -H, indicating that we're sharing one electron, molecular formula H2. Here's oxygen coming along. So oxygen is gonna have seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, gonna have. So we have, and it actually is gonna make two, correct? One, two, three, and then it shares two more. So each one's gonna share one. Okay, got it, sorry. So oxygen is able to make a double bond because it needs to have two electrons shared back and forth. Um, and so that means that it's able to double bond to itself. That's depicted here as a double bond O and as O2. Um, nitrogen is going to be able to make um, three bonds, has the ability to make a triple bond. And so that means that it's going to be NH2. Um, and nitrogen also doesn't have to make a triple bond. It can also make a double bond, single bond, or three single bonds. Is it again that? What's that? Yeah. Which ones of these are what? Um, the difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds is going to be on there. Um, how many um, valence electrons in each of these? Probably not, but you need to know carbon has four. Carbon has four. Really what you need to know, how many handshakes can it make? Carbon can make four handshakes. Hydrogen can make one handshake. Oxygen two. Nitrogen three. Okay? okay? So that's really all you need to know. And when I say handshakes, I obviously mean covalent bonds. How many, sh how many share covalent bonds? Um, and so here, for example, here's carbon, which can make four, and it's gonna be a methane molecule, so we have four hydrogens. So that indicates one single bond to each of four different hydrogens. Um, so you just kinda need to know that, because when you're looking at the molecular structure, you need to know how many handshakes or bonds it can make to the other ones, which is also gonna determine its actual orientation, um, like three-dimensionally, but we're not doing chemistry today, we're just kinda overdoing chemistry today. Um, but this bottom one, this is the one I want you to pay attention to. This is water. We're going to be using this all semester long, so you do need to know this one pretty well. What is this? It's going to be two hydrogen and one oxygen, but because of the fact that we have an unequal sharing of these electrons, let's go back to the lawnmower example. I'm going to share my lawnmower with my neighbor, 
but my lawn is twice the size of my neighbor's lawn, right? So the lawn mower is only gonna be used half as much time for that lawn as it is for my lawn, even though we use it as often. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the same thing happening here. We have an electron that is gonna be orbiting hydrogen. Because the hydrogen orbit is so much smaller, because it's a small shell, so that inner shell contains two, then it's gonna go around oxygen. Oxygen's a heck of a lot longer. It's gonna utilize the lawnmower for a longer period of time. So if it does one orbit around oxygen and one orbit around hydrogen, it's gonna spend longer around oxygen than it does around hydrogen. Yeah? That means we're gonna have partial charges. It's a little bit positive when it's here and a little bit negative when it's here, right? Well, at least this side is a little bit positive and this side is a little bit negative because the atom is gonna have the electron over this section more often. It also is going to cause this strange shape here. You would think that if you were making two hand holds, you'd be holding them like this, right? But you're not, why not? This is negative and these two are positive. So we've got like a little bit of a repulsion happening between this negative side and these two positive sides, right? Um, so we're gonna kind of have this three-dimensional structure that makes it like that, like the Mickey Mouse ears that we're gonna see going forward. Again, here we have this H2O, and here we have this structure, which is gonna be also H2O, but that's the structural formula for it, showing three-dimensional. Okay, what does that mean? That means that we're going to be able to have partial positive and partial negative charges, which are able to disrupt ionic bonds, and also able to interact with other water molecules around it to create hydrogen bonding, which means so this partial positive here can interact with the water molecule over here in the partial negative region, making a hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding by itself is really weak, but cumulatively can be very strong. And I have a feeling that's gonna be coming up next, so let me go forward. There we go, boom, hydrogen bonds. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are gonna happen when we're looking at one molecule of water and another molecule of water. To be clear, this is not the bond that is happening in the same molecule of water between the hydrogen and oxygen, right? That's a polar covalent bond. But this, between this partial positive and this partial negative, is hydrogen bonding. And this is really strong cumulatively. If you've ever seen a drop of water, it beads up on the counter, right? And if you put a napkin in it, it's going to pull all the water up not just a little bit, but while it's still touching the water, you're gonna have capillary action pulling it all the way up. This is strong enough to be able to take the water from the bottom of the ground and take it all the way up the roots, all the way up to the top of the trees, right? It's also why if you've ever even given roses on Valentine's Day, they tell you to cut them under running water before you put them in the vase. Why? Because the capillary action doesn't work if there's bubbles. So if it's already been cut at the stalk and it's got air going up and you put those roses in water, they're not sucking up any water because there's no hydrogen bonds. So you put them under water in a bowl of water, you cut them, so you go up further enough, there's no bubbles because you've gotten rid of the bottom part of the stalk. Then you'll be able to put them in water. Now they'll suck the water up because the capillary action is restored. Okay? I just saved your Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> anyway, lots of hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are super weak by themselves, but in cumulative mass, they're going to be very, very strong. It's going to give us also uh, the surface tension of water. So you know, if you've ever seen water striders or like water lizards run across the surface of the water or a leaf fall and float on the surface of the water and not sink, that's because the hydrogen bonds themselves are pushing up because they're hold, the water is holding onto itself more than it's holding onto the leaf, right? Okay, so what is a chemical reaction? Chemical reaction is any time that we take a starting substance and we break down the bonds and create new ones, okay? So to be clear, we are always starting out with the same amount of Legos. On both sides of this equation, we have two oxygen atoms and four hydrogen atoms. But we're disassembling the small pieces and building up another Lego piece, right? So we're creating a new molecule. So we're starting with what's called the reactants. This might also be called substrates. We're gonna have some sort of energy either going in or coming out. And we're gonna create products, in this case, water, okay? Now, again, sometimes we're taking two small objects and putting them together to create a larger object. That's anabolism, or the anabolic pathways. Sometimes we're taking large objects, breaking them down into smaller objects. Catabolic pathways. Anabolism and catabolism together. Metabolism. All of the chemical reactions occurring in your cell at any given moment. Right? And we have tons of metabolic pathways. In fact, that's one of the things that we still haven't quite figured out entirely. Um, Do we actually know that? What's that? All. Anabolic and whatever equals. The difference between anabolic and catabolic, not for this one. This is something we'll, we'll get its own chapter. We'll get there. We have a whole metabolism chapter. <laughs> and then you're going to need to know different specific metabolic pathways. Got yeah. you, good girl. Yeah, but we're not there yet. This is all, there's a lot of what I have already told you, but there's also a lot of what I'm going to tell you in here, too. Um, okay, so we have multiple different types of energy. And this is what I did when I was on Zoom, so you didn't get to see it, but I always do this. Potential energy is energy that is stored in matter by where its relative location is, right? 
So the potential energy right now is that it could fall, and now it has kinetic energy as it's falling. So at the top of the roller coaster, potential. Going down the roller coaster, kinetic, right? And you have more potential energy depending on where you are. So I have less potential energy if I were to hold it here than if I were to hold it here than if I were to go outside and hold it over the balcony, right? Because it's got further to fall. It's going to get more kinetic energy as it goes down. So potential energy is relative to the amount of kinetic energy that it could potentially have, right? Right? So it's like taking a student and saying, you can go to college and here's all the money for medical school. That student has more potential. Then a student, you say, sorry, you're going to have to drop out in third grade to help feed your family, right? Doesn't mean that they're any smarter. It means that they have more potential of going further. So again, the same pair of sunglasses here has less potential energy than it does if it's dangling over the balcony because it could potentially have more energy in terms of kinetic energy in the future. All right, chemical energy is a little bit different. And we're going to be talking about chemical energy when we talk about metabolism for sure. Chemical energy is when we are going to be changing chemical compounds and utilizing the energy stored in those bonds to make a new product. A good example of chemical energy is setting something on fire. It is almost impossible to get it back, right? So when you enter into a pathway where you're going to be changing from A to B and B to C and C to D and E to F, et cetera, very rarely are you gonna be able to go from Z back to A, right? You have a lot of conversions that are happening in chemical energy. Also to be clear, the total amount of energy starts off at the same amount that it ends up, but the usable energy changes over time, right? So what happens is that we're going to lose energy to heat and to friction, et cetera. So if you have 100 units of gasoline energy, if you will, and I'm just making that up, and then you put it in the car, you're only gonna get 80 units of actual driving energy and 20 units of heat energy and friction energy, right? So as we convert energy from one usable form to the next, we are not losing the amount of energy but we are losing the usable amount of energy in a system, and that is going towards what we call entropy. Okay, and I'm a little bit over where we're gonna be talking about in depth here, so. Um, okay, so in chemical reactions, we are going to either have to put energy in, or we're going to have energy that is coming out. Oftentimes, when we're taking small products and building large ones, we're gonna to have to put energy in, and when we're taking large ones and breaking it down into smaller ones, we're gonna get energy out. Think a molecule of glucose. That molecule of glucose is gonna get broken down into six carbon dioxide molecules as we go through cellular respiration. Each time that it gets smaller and smaller, we're going to release energy that's gonna release ATP. Well, it's not gonna release energy. That energy is gonna be used to drive the creation of ATP. And we'll talk about what ATP does anyway in a second. But the point is that all energetic reactions are going to either require energy or create energy. If energy has to go in, it's called endergonic. Starts out lower energy, ends up higher energy, endergonic, usually building things up. If we start at a higher energy and end up a lower energy, energy is exiting the system, it's exergonic. So does energy have to come in or enter? Endergonic, does energy come out or exit? Exergonic. All right, usually these reactions are coupled. Why? We don't wanna lose the energy. So if you have a reaction over here that's releasing energy, and there's a reaction over here that needs to drive energy, or needs energy to drive, we would love to be able to take that energy from your reaction and use it to have their reaction occur, right? Then if they're right next to each other, that's no problem. But sometimes the reaction's all the way on this side of the cell. You guys are releasing energy at your reaction. And you two all the way over here need the energy for your reaction, all right? So where's that energy gonna come from? And you guys aren't even anywhere next to each other. How does the energy get there? And that's where ATP comes in. So we have ADP and ATP. It's just not, I guess we're not going into that now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on it anyway. So we have ADP and ATP. Diphosphate is the lower energy version, triphosphate is the higher energy version. And over here, these ladies have a reaction that's going to be exergonic, energy's exiting the system. I'm ADP sitting over here with my free phosphate next to me. When energy leaves, I'm gonna take that, and I'm gonna take that free phosphate, I'm gonna make it my TP, so this is my third phosphate here, we've stored this energy right here. I'm gonna take it right over here, and I'm gonna drop off the free phosphate, Releasing energy that you guys can utilize. Okay, so that's what ATP does. It's constantly taking energy from a reaction that releases it and delivering it to the reaction that needs it. So it's not like a carrier? It is a carrier, correct. It's one of many different types. We'll call it cellular currency, but it's an energy carrier molecule. That's exactly what it is. And adenosine is the same A that we talk about when we talk about A, T, C, and G in DNA. So it's a nucleotide. It also has that sugar phosphate backbone that you might see in a nucleotide. But instead of just being sugar phosphate, which then attaches just to a sugar phosphate to make that long chain, it's just going to have a triple phosphate. So by having that second phosphate on it, it pretends it actually is going to avoid being able to be used integrated into DNA. So AMP or monophosphate will be utilized for DNA. ADP will be sitting around waiting for that third phosphate to become ATP. 
but a, a DP is never going to be utilized for DNA, so that's going to keep it kind of separate. That's off topic entirely, but I wanted you to understand that that's the link between exergonic and yeah. endergonic reactions. On top of that, um, we're going to need energy to start a reaction. That's called activation energy. We call it this get up, the get up off the couch energy, right? We all know that washing our dishes takes five minutes. But we will dally for half an hour before we do them, right? And we're at hours or a couple of days, right? But when the roommate's mother knocks on the door, you're gonna get up and do those dishes like right again, right? That's the activation energy, the get up off the couch energy. They're like, I'm laying on the couch and I don't really wanna do anything, but then my best friend calls and says, let's go lay down. You're like, okay, fine, right? That's the activation energy. You could have done it on your own, but you didn't because you were just kind of lazy about it. And reactions are kind of the same way. They need some sort of energy input to get started. You can picture having gas flowing, and then you need a spark to be able to get fire, right? You need just a little bit more energy to keep that going. Once you have the fire, the reaction's going. So once you start it, it goes on its own, right? Um, so activation energy is the initial energy needed to start the reaction. And catalysts are specialty chemical compounds that speed up the chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. This is the roommate's mother, right? This is your best friend saying, hey, let's go, I may This is whatever it is that says, hey, you really need to do this. The landlord says, hey, you gotta clean up or I'm gonna kick you out. Whatever is your catalyst is going to get you up off the couch and get that reaction started. So again, these reactions would occur on their own without the help of the enzyme, but the enzymes are going to speed up the rate at which they occur. So in a reaction that might only occur, I don't know, once every couple of seconds will now occur on the millisecond level, right? Sometimes hundreds of thousands of times more fast. Um, all right, so again, catalysts are going to be any uh, enzymes or biological catalysts, so any sort of compound that speeds up the rate of a reaction. Okay, we have multiple different types of chemical reactions. I feel like I already talked about this. We have synthesis reactions, which are going to take two mo molecules and put them together to make a larger molecule. This is typically gonna be an anabolic reaction, right? Take anabolic steroids, fuck you up, right? Catabolic reactions are gonna be taking large molecules and breaking them like a cat would swipe something off a table and break something on the floor. And all of your anabolic and catabolic reactions are going to be metabolism. Okay, we have decomposition reactions and exchange reactions. So a decomposition reactions when we're breaking something down, a catabolic reaction. We can also have an exchange reaction where it's not getting larger or smaller, it's just exchanging one atom for another or a couple atoms for another. Um, so it's basically a conversion reaction. And sometimes we have reactions that are reversible, but not all. A lot of reactions are what we call irreversible reactions because as soon as we go from A to B, B gets converted into C and C gets converted into D and eventually can no longer feed backward into the pathway. But some reactions are reversible reactions, like buffers, for example. So buffers are meant to either pick up extra hydrogen or extra hydroxyl groups in solution to help maintain our pH. So if our pH gets too high because we have too many hydroxyl groups, they'll grab those and get them out of solution, bringing our pH back down. If our pH gets too low because we have too many hydrogens, pull them out of solution, right? So that's what buffers do, reversible reactions. So some things that are very easily undone, other things a little bit more difficult. All right, now, I also said that sometimes we have electrons that are gonna exchange places from one molecule to another. When we have a loss of electrons, it's called oxidation, loss of electrons, Leo, the lion goes ger, ger, gain of electron reduction, loss of electrons, oxidation. Okay, the other line goes ger, I know it's dumb, but it works. Okay, and also we never have a reduction reaction without also having an oxidation reaction. So nobody ever calls it a reduction reaction or an oxidation reaction. What do we call it? A redox reaction, right? Why? Because if I'm losing an electron, you're gaining one, right? It's like me stealing that pencil. It didn't disappear. I'm not making that to give it to me. But that pencil doesn't actually disappear, right? It just gets transferred in ownership. All right, so we talked about compounds and solutions in terms of being organic or inorganic. And we also talked about always having that friend that's like, I only eat organic food, right? And you can always stump her by saying, sorry, Karen, that water is an inorganic molecule and good percentage of whatever you're eating, especially if it's fruit or whatever, is gonna have that inorganic compound in it. Um, because we utilize organic and inorganic in a totally different way in our society. We talk about whether or not they have pesticides, whether or not it's been um, GMOs, yada yada, right? But really what it means is what's a chemical structure? Does it have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it? And if it doesn't, if it only has hydrogen and oxygen, like water, it's inorganic. And newsflash, some of the most toxic compounds, mustard gas, arsenic, etc., biomimics that work in your body as nervous compounds work because they're organic molecules. <laughs> So just because something is organic does not mean that it's good for you, right? It literally just means that it is comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that's it. All right, 
We also talked about water being polar. We just talked about that a moment ago, actually. Water being a molecule that has partial positive and partial negative charges on it. So although we have polar, although we have covalent bonds, a polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen in the same water molecule, we're able to make hydrogen bonds between those partial and positive negative charges in separate water molecules. We also are able to use water in a really cool way in that we can divide water in half, called hydrolysis, and use it to cap off sticky ends and reactions. And if we're trying to take two molecules and bring them together, we can chop up a hydrogen and an OH group, put them together to make water, and put them together in a synthesis reaction. All right, so water is going to be useful in metabolic pathways because it's going to help us build things up and break things down. It's also a really good solvent. So remember that really cute little dance partner that we saw there with sodium and chloride and how much they were really all oriented in this beautiful little crystalline structure, right? Kind of monogamous compounds. Well, guess what? These guys are very polyamorous. Water is going to pull all of the dance partners apart. These partial negative charges on the oxygen is going to pull that full sodium right, has a positive charge away and all of these partial negative charge sorry partial positive charges on the hydrogen are going to add up to a full positive charge pulling chlorine away from its dance partner this is why ionic compounds do not do well in aqueous solution right because they're just going to dissolve as soon as polar molecules like water pull them apart that's why all of our biomolecules are covalently bonded um, so although we do use ions for certain things like electrolytes etc all of our body is comprised of molecules that are held together by covalent bonds. All right, this is what I was talking about when I said that water is really important for building up and breaking down reactions. So if we have, here we have two separate molecules. These are monomers, mono meaning one train car. These are monosaccharides because they are monomers of sugar. So glucose and fructose are monosaccharides. And the example that I give in class is if we have two people that are out, say, on a date at the movie theater, and we want them to be able to hold hands, but one person has popcorn in one hand and the other person has soda in the other, they're never going to be able to hold hands, right? So what do you have to do? You have to remove the popcorn and the soda to make what we would call sticky ends in chemistry. So we'll remove the hydrogen from the one and the hydroxyl from the other. Now we have a reactive group, a little sticky ends, that's going to come together and hold hands. This is called dehydration synthesis. Water comes out and we synthesize a new molecule. It's also called anabolism because we're starting from something smaller and making it bigger. Now, if we go the opposite direction, catabolism, we have something now that's a dimer or a disaccharide because it's a dimer of a sugar. This disaccharide can be split apart, but what do we do if we want to rip the hands apart of that couple at the movie theater? Each of them have to get the popcorn and the soda back, right? And in this case, that's going to be the water, which we have to split that water molecule together, right? So that water molecule is then going to become the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl group, which are basically that popcorn and soda that I talked about, to cap off those sticky ends so the reaction won't go in the reverse. Okay, so we're constantly using, utilizing water. We're breaking water down, we're building water up from all of these synthesis and just decomposition reactions. All right, what else do we utilize water for? Temperature control, right? If we walk outside in a 90 degree day, we don't end up overheating. Why not? Because water is able to absorb a lot of that heat and it's going to have what's called a, um, a high heat of vaporization, which means that it has it's a really large amount of energy for water to boil over, which is going to be protective for us. Um, and we also use water in our body as a lubricant. So if you do this right now, you don't have to, but I like to watch people do it. But if you do this right now, and for those of you at home, I'm kind of twisting back and forth, you're not feeling all of your inner organs slide across each other, right? You might feel your back if you're a little bit older like me, but you're not feeling all of your inner organs. Why not? because we're using water as a lubricant between them to allow them to slide across each other. We're also using water as the medium for like the pericardial fluid and the pleural fluid, et cetera, in these sacs. Again, to help reduce the friction, okay? Um, now we're gonna move on to when we put things together. If we put a solute and a solvent together, we can make a mixture. Now, there are three major types of mixtures. One, is it a solution, which is the one I just talked about, where we put a solvent, which is the liquid, and a solute, which is, in this case, could be sugar or salt or whatever. It's whatever the, the solid is going to get dissolved in there. That's going to make a solution. And we can measure that in percentage or in molarity. Um, but we can also have a suspension or a gel, which is a colloid solution, basically. Um, in a suspension, we're going to basically have picture like sand and water. You can shake it up, but if you put that water bottle down for an hour, it's all going to settle out. The sand's not actually going to go into the water. As opposed to sugar and water, that's going to be a sugar water solution. Okay, 
Again, the way that we talk about solutions have to do with the way that we describe the concentration of the molecule. How much of X in Y, right? So how much sugar in the water, how many grams of salt in the water? And we do that either by percentage, which gives a relative mass, given a volume solution, five grams in 100 milliliters would be 5%, right? Five grams in one liter would be 0.5%. So it's just how many grams out of 100, essentially. And we can also look at molarity, which takes into account the molecular weight of a substance. And by utilizing that molecular weight, which is how much weight um, a mole of substance, which is like 6.022 times 10 to the negative 22nd, right? Um, Avogadro's number. So that's how many of the sugar molecules together would create this molecular weight, or how many molecules of salt we would put together to have a molecular weight of 58.4 or 56.4, whatever it is. Anyway, that's something that'll be given to you. You won't have to know it. But the molecular weight of the compound will be provided for you, and you will put that amount in one liter of solution, or one tenth of that in 100 milliliters, right? One tenth of that in one tenth of solution. All right, so again, just two different ways that we look at the concentration. That brings us to acids or bases. Now, when we're looking at acids and bases, we are looking at the concentration of hydrogen relative to the concentration of hydroxyl groups. And if we are even Steven, we're at seven pH of seven, right? So if we are 50, 50, we're at a pH of seven. If we have more hydrogen ions, then we have hydroxyl groups, we're getting into the acidic range. So acids are gonna ionize into more hydrogen ions and some other anion and another negative ion. And of salts, it's gonna dissolve and become E neutral, right? Because the salt is gonna have even amounts of sodium and hydroxyl, because we haven't changed that, because we've added that, sorry. Even amounts of hydrogen and oxygen, because all we've added is sodium and chloride, for example. So I'll take a look at that in one second as I move to the next image. Okay, so. This is the salt, which I was just talking about. So I'm gonna start with C. This is the sodium chloride solution, or in this case, potassium chloride solution. Um, this is going to ionize, or create electrolytes, of, so, of sorry, potassium and chloride, right? But it's not gonna change the concentration of hydrogen or hydroxyl in any way, right? That's why it's considered a salt. But when we have a positive or negative, positive and negative that come together that are going to have an OH group, but not a hydrogen, or a hydrogen but not an OH group, now we have acids or bases. So this is hydrochloric acid, HCl. If we put it into water, it's gonna dissociate into hydrogen ions and chlorine. While the overall positive negative balance is the same, we are now adding more hydrogen and not adding more hydroxyl, we are dropping the pH. If we add potassium hydroxide, again, we're gonna keep the same amount of positive and negative ions in solution, but we are changing the relative concentration of OH to hydrogen which is going to give us a basic solution. We're gonna increase our pH, okay? So at a pH of seven, we're gonna have neutral or equal amounts of hydrogen and oxygen. Values below seven are gonna be acidic. Values above seven are gonna be alkaline or basic, right? Okay, and this is the chart. Here we have a pH of seven that's neutral right there in the, set, in the center. And I wanna take a moment to point out that this is what's called logarithmic, which means that we're not just increasing a little bit, we're increasing by a value of 10 each time. So we have tenfold more hydrogen here, one hundredfold more hydrogen here than we did at seven, one thousandfold more hydrogen here than we did at seven, right? So as we get further and further and further out, we're at our ten thousandfold, one hundred thousandfold, right? We're getting to be very drastic differences between hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen and hydroxyl. So we're not talking about small changes. We're talking about very large changes. And again, if we go this direction towards the basic, we're talking about much less hydrogen than the um, hydroxyl groups. Now within the human body, this is what we're aiming for, somewhere between like six and a half to seven and a half is most of our bodily fluids. Exceptions include the stomach, right? Low stomach acid, pH of about two and change until we put food in it, then it jumps up to about four. Also includes the vaginal canal, why? External opening, so it's gonna have to have a fight off microbes, so it has a lower pH. One of the first things the sperm are gonna have to overcome during their reproductive journey. Um, the next thing that I wanna say might have a really low pH, your tears. Right? You're gonna, not they're not gonna have a really low pH, but they're gonna have a little bit lower because they're also going to be trying to eliminate foreign microbes, right? Now as we head this way towards the basic on our alkaline, we're gonna actually get out of our food groups pretty fast. So up here, we're gonna get into our cleaners, right? We're gonna get into things like um, our oven cleaners, et cetera. Also on the increase to the acidic region, we're also gonna get into some cleaners. This is why you never mix your bathroom cleaners. You could end up making mustard gas and killing yourself or your children. So make sure that you're very careful never to say, oh, this bottle's halfway empty and that bottle's halfway empty. I'll combine them. Boom. 
right? No joke, people do this all the time, and it's one of the highest casualties of like the, the fire department, right? People don't know basic chemistry, and then they create a little mini bomb in their bathroom, or worse, they create a gas, doesn't explode, they don't know there's a problem, and then it starts actually causing real damage, like neurotoxins, right? So anyway, I'm off topic, but this is why you have to be really careful that you don't mix chemicals in your kitchen or in your bathroom. Um, okay, so all of the molecules in the human body are gonna be biomolecules that are made basically of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The major biomolecules that we're gonna be talking about are gonna include carbohydrates, fats, um, so carbohydrates are gonna include sugars, um, we're gonna have fats, we're gonna have nucleic acids, which are like DNA and RNA, and we're gonna have um, our amino acids, which is our protein, okay? Um, carbohydrates are gonna be what provides most of the energy that we utilize for life. It's gonna include our basic sugars, which are our, our mono and disaccharides. Polysaccharides are gonna be carbohydrates, including starches, glycogen, cellulose, et cetera. And we're able to oh, convert these. Zoom ended, oh, sorry. sorry, just one second. Hopefully they know to come back. <laughs> I probably get less and less each time. All right, escape for a moment. Back here. That's right, our brains need a moment to catch up, don't they? All right, so. All right, welcome back, everyone. Sorry about that. I really should just pay for the upgraded version. All right, here we go. Um, so again, carbohydrates are going to be what are providing energy. And we're gonna have the simplest version of mono and disaccharides. Then they're gonna build up those are simple sugars. And then they're gonna build up into the polysaccharides, which are the large chains of sugars. We have two major types of these different uh, monomers, monosaccharides. We have pentoses and hexoses. Anybody recognize deoxyribose and ribose? Come on, brownie points. Where does that come from? Where do we see deoxyribose or ribose? DNA. DNA and RNA, that's right. This is the sugar that's found in the actual bases, the A, T, C, and G for DNA, and A, U, G, and C for ribose or RNA, right? So those are pentoses. We also have hexoses, which are our sugars, glucose, fructose, galactose, et cetera. Um, basically differences, six carbons, uh, uh, oh, sorry, five carbons, six carbons. Okay, as we put them together, which of course we're gonna do by dehydration synthesis, we're going to make dimers. Some examples of dimers include lactose and maltose. You do not need to know that lactose is galactose and glucose and maltose is glucose and glucose, but you do need to know which ones are monomers and which ones are dimers. Table sugar, sucrose, is a dimer, okay? Um, now polysaccharides are gonna be much longer. We really much, we're gonna go with, it's basically either um, mono and disaccharides or much, much, much longer polysaccharides. So mono and di are gonna be your simple sugars and the long ones are gonna be your carbohydrates. And it's gonna have hundreds, like really long train of these monomers. Okay, so glycogen is gonna be the main polysaccharide that we utilize in the human body. And it's basically going to be stored in places like the liver or skeletal muscles inside the cells. And we'll be able to access it if we have low glucose, low blood sugars. We can take this glycogen and break it down and release the amounts of sugars into the bloodstream that can then get picked up by the cells. And also, if we just eat a bunch of sugar that we're not going to utilize immediately, we can convert it into glycogen and store it in the liver and skeletal muscles for later. So it's kind of like our pantry. This is where we're going to be storing a lot of our sugar molecules, but again, they're going to be combined into really long carbohydrates that we're able to, or these glycogen molecules that we're able to store for later. And then when we need one, we're just going to go there and like pop off one glucose molecule, which we can enter into cellular respiration for energy. Um, so again, long versions of polysaccharides are going to include starches. Um, also, those are going to be found in certain types of plants are going to have starches more than others, like our root shoot vegetables. I mean, all of them are going to have some starch, but some things are going to have a lot more starches, like rice, for example. Um, and that's going to be basically where plants are going to store their energy, the same way that we store it in the liver as animals. Now, there's a special polysaccharide that is made from glucose, but it's undigestible to humans, and it's called cellulose. And this was the time when I told a really stupid joke that nobody ever laughs at, that the termite walks into the bar and says, where's the bartender? And the reason is because he wants to eat the bar. Why? Because termites are the only animal that are able to digest cellulose. So they're able to digest the wood in the bar, which is why termites eat wood, right? So where's the bartender, right? All right. So it's not funny, but it hopefully it'll help you remember. Um, and no one ever laughs at it, so it's my gauge for. Oh, my God. 
Is someone <laughs> laughing on Zoom? <laughs> Good. At least I got a little bit off. I don't ever get it the first time around. Maybe once it settles. Or maybe it's just been a long week. <laughs> All right. It's only Tuesday. Anyway, and we had a holiday yesterday, so it couldn't possibly have been that long. Um, so anyway, so this is a special polysaccharide that's going to be formed in certain plants. And one of the other places that we find it is in, for example, corn. So if a kernel of corn goes through the body without being chewed or masticated, right, the process of mastication is chewing, if it doesn't get chewed up and it enters into the digestive tract and there's no hole in it, there's no way for the body to get to any of the good stuff inside that kernel of corn. So where does it do? It passes through completely undigested. We've all had that happen, right? So what do we do for elderly people who might not have the ability to chew very well? What do we do? Blend it. We make creamed corn, we make corn meal, we make corn bread, that's right. We mash it up so that it's opened. And once it's opened up for them, it's like externally chewing essentially. Once it's opened, then our enzymes are able to access it no problem. So that cellulose being in there isn't a problem, it just passes through undigested, but at least we're able to get the nutrients out of it. Okay, um, so that's carbohydrates. Let's talk about lipids. Lipids are gonna be um, a specialty molecule that's going to be Nonpolar, which means that it's not going to interact well with water, which allows it to associate into structures that can separate the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. So lipids are very important in like the phospholipid bilayer, for example. So they're going to have less polar covalent bonds and are mainly going to be insoluble in polar solvents like water because they're hydrophobic molecules. They're lipids. They're like oils. So in order to become soluble, they have to join the specialty proteins and become what's called a lipoprotein, and they can become what's called amphipathic. Amphipathic means that you have one half that's gonna be polar, and one half, doesn't have to be half, one section that's polar and one section that's nonpolar. So you have one section that can interact with water and one section that can interact with lipids, and that's going to allow you to cross the barrier. This is what we do with soap. This is how we get the grease off of our dishes. If you just write a ton, a ton of water on that grease and scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, and you just spread that grease around, right? You're never going to get that dish clean. But if you add soap to it, all of a sudden, what happens? Well, all of the grease comes up in these little bubbles and sits on the surface of the water. And you go, why? Because soap is an amphipathic molecule, and it's got one hand that holds onto the grease and one hand that holds onto the water and pulls the two together to pull it off the pan to bring it up to the top in little unicellular structures, okay? So that's called amphipathic. And a really important amphipathic molecule in the human body is going to be the phospholipids, which makes a barrier function from the inside and the outside of the cell. Okay, um, we also use fats to make fatty acids. Fatty acids are able to form triglycerides and are going to make the tail for the phospholipids. And these are going to be a good place to make cellular energy. These guys can be saturated. I don't know if you remember, we have. Um, it talks about it, it looks like a row of airline seats with every seat taken with hydrogen, so it's carbon down the middle and hydrogen all the way down. That's saturated. If at any point we have a double bond of the carbon and there basically looks like there's a seat missing on either side, that's going to be unsaturated. Okay? Um, and I have a feeling there's supposed to be a picture there that is not. Um, anyway, you guys can follow along at home. I'm sure the picture's in the text. Some fatty acids are able to be made by the body. Those are called non-essential. Others. Um, are not able to be made from the body and are going to have to be eaten in your diet. They are called essential, and we have to get them from like supplements or whatnot. All right, why don't I have any pictures? There we go. Okay, so here's a triglyceride or a fat molecule. You do not need to memorize the difference between palmitic or steric or oleic or know which one is saturated or unsaturated. It's not a chemistry class, but I do want you to look at this and tell me which ones are saturated. The top two, which one's unsaturated? The bottom one, why? We have one double bond here. And how many, how many unsaturation is it? It's a monounsaturated, one kink. If we had another kink, it would be di or triunsaturated. How many seeds are open, right? Here we have one double bond, so it's monounsaturated. If we had two double bonds, it would be diunsaturated or polyunsaturated, okay? Um, and these guys are gonna be connected here by um, a ester linkage to a glycerol molecule here at the top. Now, triglycerides can either be solids or liquids at room temperature. And that's going to basically be the percentage of these fatty acid panels that are saturated or unsaturated. If you picture that all of these guys are paper clip, these set would fit into a box much better than this one would, right? Because it has a kink in it, so it doesn't sit tightly, which means there's going to be space between it. Okay, so the saturated ones are going to stack down much more nicely and become your solids at room temperature. Think bacon grease, butter, right? They're all going to be your saturated fats. Now your unsaturated fats, because they have kinks in them, are a little bit more slippery. Things like olive oils, vegetable oils, etc. right? Um, but anyway, these are going to be the, the most plentiful lipid in the body. They do a couple things. Number one, they are our blubber. No, we don't have blubber, but they are our protective layer. They are our thermal protective layer. 
This is the side note where I tell you that if you have someone who comes in with a skin problem because they have had road rash or they have had a severe burns or whatever, they're gonna have issues with temperature regulation. Why? Because that fat layer, which is right underneath the skin, is the region that is going to keep them warm. And it's probably been ripped off if you can see muscle underneath, right? So especially if it's a very large patch, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're giving them warm blankets and obviously secondarily they're gonna worry about infection, but we're off topic. Um, okay, so triglycerides are going to store energy as well. These are our fat reserves. We can utilize them to um, drive cellular reactions and they're gonna give us a lot more bang for our buck than our other biomolecules. So these guys are gonna give us nine um, calories per gram. Everything else is gonna give us around four. So about double the bang for the buck out of our fat. And we're gonna store it longer. So this is gonna be the kind of our long-term energy storage. So if the, um, if the carbohydrates or the polysaccharides are what's in the pantry, these guys are the deep freeze, right? We typically don't access these until we have burned through all of our carbohydrates. This is why they tell you that if you wanna burn some fat, you're gonna to wanna to exercise for 40 minutes in a row. Not 10 minutes here, not 10 minutes there. Cause those first 20 minutes or 25 minutes, you're still burning through your carbs. You're not gonna get, gotta go through your entire pantry before you get to your deep freeze, right? So you're not gonna to get to burning your fats for the first half hour, 45 minutes. So what is it like, if you're gonna do cardio, do cardio at the end of your workout? Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but it probably is gonna be more effective. That would make sense <laughs> if you were already in the burning your fat zone. Um, just kind of to extend how long you're doing it. I'm not really sure. Um, obviously, I don't <laughs> exercise myself. Um, I do, but like hiking. Anyway, I'm off topic. So what do we do with extra food that comes in? So basically, it all comes down to calories in, calories out. If the calories coming in are going to be burned immediately, they go into the pantry. So they're going to go into the glycogen reserves, right? If they're not going to be burned immediately because the pantry is full, because we just keep eating, but we're not exercising, right? That means it's going to end up going into the deep freeze in the form of fat, right? So these are your longer term reserves. And these aren't going to come out again until you burn through. So we're going to be able to store that extra food in these triglyceride storage. And as we've all seen from my 600 pound life, triglyceride storage is almost <laughs> unlimited. Really, right? We can gain more and more and more body fat until it's morbidly obese and continue to grow. Because what's happening, our deep freeze has no limits, right? If we keep bringing in calories that we're not burning out, it has to go somewhere. It literally is a metabolic equation of calories in, calories out. Okay. Um, I love that show. All right. <laughs> um, phospholipids are going to form a barrier function between the inside and the outside of the cell. We're going to do it by having a double phospholipid bilayer. Um, each of them are going to have the polar heads oriented towards the aqueous interface. That means that they're going to be inverse, right? So the polar heads are towards the extracellular fluid and towards the interstitial fluid with their tails hanging towards each other. This forms a nice little lipid separating layer between inside and outside, okay? These are really important membrane components, and as I mentioned, they are amphipathic. This region is polar, interacts with water. This region is nonpolar and interacts with lipids, and this is really important because with the way this is oriented, we know we're gonna have a nice thin little oil layer in a full bubble around the cell. Okay, um, let's talk about steroids. Steroids are gonna start with carbonates. They're going to comprise our cholesterol, our sex hormones, Cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Um, this is the moment in lecture when I told you to take a good hard look at the difference between testosterone and estrogen, or estradiol, which is a type of estrogen. What's the main difference? H1 and then this also CH3 group, right? It's really not that big of a deal. These are interconvertible very easily within your body, right? Estrogens and androgens go back and forth, which this is the point where most people go, what? I thought boys have boy hormones and girls have girl hormones. We both have both. It's a ratio, right? And our ratio changes as we go through sexual development, as we hit menopause, right? At all these different stages of our life, we're gonna have different percentages of these. Um, but we're actually gonna be able to intercovert them pretty easily. Um, here's cortisol. Cortisol is gonna be like the stress hormone. Here's cholesterol, um, which is gonna be a steroid, but it's gonna be involved in the in membrane. Is there medicine that can lower cortisol? Uh, sure, absolutely. There's a medicine that can target any biomolecule. We can add things exogenously, anything you want, basically. Not that you want, but anything you're missing. There's a drug that, so if you have low cortisol levels, we can add it. Uh -huh. uh, and basically, any biomolecule that we can create in the laboratory, we can get to the right adjustment in your body if homeostasis, if you are out of homeostatic, imba in homeostatic imbalance, there you go. So if you're out of balance, we can fix it metabolically by, uh, in fact, a uh, good example of that is thyroid hormones. There's a lot of people, and I'm not going to ask specifically because HIPAA, but everybody knows somebody that's taking some sort of thyroid medicine. And oftentimes, if I ask the class, they go, yeah, me, or yeah, my mom, right? Everybody knows someone. Because thyroid medicine is something that is really easy for us to 
fix basically to exogenously add back in. So what we do, and we'll talk about the thyroid, we'll get there, but the thyroid does several different things that are involved in metabolism, and if we end up with low thyroid capability, we end up with a decreased metabolism, we can end up with weight gain and irritability and all sorts of other issues that could occur because of our bad metabolism. But if we just add those hormones back in and take a pill every day, now you can restore that. Um, it's a really classic example of something that would be fatal on the long term if you were in a third world nation, but because we live in a first world society, it's easily treated. Diabetes is another example of this. So these are things that we can just treat with modern medicine that we no longer see as defects, as become livable diseases instead of fatalities, right? Um, okay. Uh, other uh, types of lipids include chemisoids. Um, these are gonna be things like prostaglandin and leukotrienes, those aren't gonna be tested on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, prostaglandins are gonna be helpful in hormonal regulation, right? Um, and then leukotrienes are gonna be using for our allergic and immunological responses. We'll talk about that when we get to immunology. All right, um, last but not least, or I guess not last because we still need plenty of acids, but um, new, uh, so these are amino acids. They're gonna be coming from proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. It's the monomer. They become polypeptides, so peptides and then polypeptides. And basically what happens is they are the workers of the cell. If DNA is the boss and RNA are the managers, then the proteins are the blue collar workers. And remember I told you in class that if we were all to think of a blue collar job right now, we could all think of a totally different blue collar job and still have 100,000 blue collar jobs out there, right? There's so many different blue collar jobs that are specialized that we need to make society run. And the cell is the same way. There's a million different, right, 50,000 different proteins Wait, that are gonna do different things. Can you rewind a little bit? <laughs> um, you said proteins are the makers of amino acids and polypeptide workers are what? Um, okay, so the central dogma is DNA makes RNA yeah. and RNA makes protein. Okay. DNA is housed in the nucleus, then it makes RNA in the nucleus, RNA leaves the nucleus, goes and makes protein, and that happens in the cytoplasm. So if the DNA is like the boss's office and the boss's chambers, and then it gives the instructions to the RNA, it gives those like the managers, the proteins are the blue collar workers. Okay. So as I mentioned that there were like 50,000 blue collar jobs, I'm just kind of making that number up, and they all do specific things. There are that many different proteins that all do those different jobs. And just like you would never ask someone who was a, um, a line operator to become a policeman or vice versa, they have specialty work. These proteins do the same thing. They have very special functions. Because remember, biology form defines functions. They have a very specialized form. But we have multiple classes of proteins. So I'm not going to tell you about, because we'll have specifics of each class, but um, I'm not going to talk about all 50,000 different proteins, obviously. But the major classes of proteins um, are going to be talked about in a second. They're going to be enzymes. Um, they're going to help with protection, so immunology. They regulate metabolism and other body processes. They give structure, so like the cytoskeleton is protein. They help with contraction, like actin and myosin allow transporting things in and out of the cell through the plasma membrane. Those are all membrane proteins. So proteins do everything, basically. They are the actual blue color workers in the cell. And again, they're comprised of amino acids. So the monomer is going to be amino acids. The dimer is going to be a peptide, and then a polypeptide is going to be the polymer. We know also, again, they're all going to be made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and they have specialty little groups that hang off of them. Please let this image show up. Great. Okay, so here we have a amino acid, not an iso acid, waka waka. All right, amino acid is going to have one side that's an amino group and one side that's a carboxylic group. You can see it's an acid because it's COOH. We're going to end up removing that OH and this H. To make water, and then that's we're removing the popcorn from the and the, um, and the soda from each hand, which is going to allow two of them to come together, making a really long polypeptide chain. Now, this is all the same for every one amino on one side, carboxylic acid side on the other side, and one hydrogen. It makes a peptide bond to the one next to it, and it's lather, rinse, repeat. So, what makes protein so unique? This side chain here, which is depicted as R, which just means reactive group. And it can be all sorts of different structures, and again, form defines function. So it can be really small, like glycine, which just has another hydrogen. It can be really long, like glycine, which has a long chain. It can have tyrosine, has a large bulb in it. Proline is gonna have a pentamer that's gonna cause it to kink a little bit. So these are all gonna have these different groups that are dangling off of the side that are highly reactive. And they can kind of, not they can't react however they want, they can react however they're allowed to react, but they do react with the other molecules surrounding them, okay? So basically what happens is we have two amino acids that are going to come together to form a peptide bond through dehydration synthesis, again, taking the popcorn, taking the soda, putting the hands together, and we're going to make a nice long chain. That long chain is called the primary sequence of the amino, of the, sorry, the primary sequence 
of the peptide, of the protein, right? The secondary sequence is going to be when we make secondary structures like alpha helices, beta pd sheets, etc. Now, in this primary structure, you can only hold your hands of the amino acid next to you, right? But if you picture that we're all standing in line holding hands, and then we are in a, a um, spiral staircase, you might also be able to hold hands above you or below you, right? So we can have interactions between these guys who aren't next to each other in the chain, but might have reactive groups that would link together. And the same thing here is the beta pleated sheet looks kind of like corrugated cardboard, and the same thing, the two peaks might be next to each other, the two valleys might be next to each other, even if they weren't next to each other in the primary sequence, right? So that's called secondary structure. And then as we put that together, we get tertiary structure. Um, so that's all of one polypeptide chain, and when we put multiple polypeptide chains together, like the case of hemoglobin, which is a tetramer, it has four different poly, um, amino acids, four different polypeptide chains filled with amino acids, and that's going to each have one ferrous group, so there's four ferrous groups that are able to hold one oxygen. So those are basically the oxygen seats on the hemoglobin molecule. So again, quaternary structure is the highest level after we put together multiple polypeptide chains that all have their own secondary structures put into place. And because it is so complicated, this folding starts as the protein is being made and continues all the way until it is completed. And once we destroy it, it's called denaturing it, we never can go backwards. So it's just so complicated to fold it that we cannot fold it after we've heated it up or expose it to low pH or high salt, something like that. Okay, so what do proteins do? One whole class of proteins are enzymes. We just talked about catalysts and how catalysts lower the activation energy, right? You get about the catalyst energy. Proteins are biological catalysts that initiate reactions that would normally occur but speed up the rate of those reactions by forming a seat for the reactants to sit in, then forming a conformational or a shape change to force, in this case, we're forcing two things apart. So we're starting with the dimer and we're breaking it down. It's a catabolic reaction. And at the end of this, the enzyme remains unchanged. So although the enzyme does change throughout the reaction conformationally, it returns back to its original state to open up the seats again to allow the rinse repeat. So this is a matchmaker, in this case a divorce attorney, who ends up being by itself at the end, right? Not actually involved in the relationship, just outside of it, okay? All right, so enzymes are biological catalysts that happen inside the cell. You'll notice that they end in ACE and sugars end in OSE and they're usually gonna be the same. So lactase breaks down lactose, amylase breaks down amylose, sucrase breaks down sucrose. You get my drift here. Um, so they're usually gonna end with the same ACE that they are going to be catalyzing the OSE for. And again, the enzymes are highly specific. These seats won't let anyone sit down. They will only let sucrose bind. Enzymes are very specific for the reaction that they catalyze, like a lock and key. There is not just one enzyme. There are 20,000 different types of enzymes. Any type of reaction that needs an enzyme is gonna have a specific enzyme for it. All right, let's move on to DNA. DNA is gonna include nucleic acids, deoxyribonucleic acid, do those of you, uh, ribonucleic acid, RNA. Um, and these guys are going to be your synthesis of your, um, again, of your DNA and your ribo and your RNA. What are our base pairs? Our first base pairs are A, C, C, and G for DNA. Again, we're gonna have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base on there. Um, the sugar, phosphate, and the base are going to create one of these four, adenine, guanine, thymine, or cytosine, and they bind by two different sets of parameters, one large and one small. We can't have two large or we'd have overlap. We can't have two smaller. It wouldn't be enough. It has to be one large, one small, right? And that can be either way. And we also cannot have either two or three bondings. So remember, you remember C and G, A and, a and T bind and, and C and G bind. Um, so that's because C and G are sets of three. A and T, well, two starts with T. You can also remember that A and T are real straight lines and G and C are curved lines and that's how they're gonna bond together. Another thing to point out here, sugar phosphate backbone on the outside. If this were a crooked ladder, where you would be putting your hands would be the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone. Where you would be putting your feet would be the base pairs held together by the hydrogen bonds, okay? So that's DNA. DNA is double-stranded. It uses A, T, C, and G. And it uses the sugar deoxyribose. RNA, on the other hand, is going to use a U, G, and C, it is gonna be single-stranded, and it uses the sugar ribose. And those are the three questions the gate guards are going to ask when we're sending that transcript out of the nuclear pore. Okay, ATP is going to be an energy carrier molecule. ATP is gonna be the principal energy transfer molecule inside the cell, as I mentioned, it starts off as ADP. Why? Because AMP is gonna be utilized for DNA. So ADP diphosphate gets skipped from that, but it's the low energy form. 
And then when it gets to three, the third phosphate, the third phosphate is always just hanging out in solution. And when the reaction occurs, that's going to release energy. It's going to utilize that energy to trap this free phosphate and then travel it anywhere in the cell that we need to be able to drive the next reaction. So it's an energy carrier molecule. Again, the high energy bond is between the dye and the triphosphate. M to D isn't going to give you a very large increase, but what it does do is it escapes being utilized for DNA. All right? So ADP will always be just the first piece of hair. Like, it won't know, like, the DNA, like, not ADP. AMP would be utilized for, so monophosphate would be utilized for DNA. But diphosphate, having that extra phosphate on it, saves it from being utilized to make DNA, but doesn't give enough energy to drive any reaction. So it's just here. It's just chilling, waiting for the energy to come from another reaction. When it does, it grabs the free phosphate. So there's free phosphates everywhere in solution, whatever's nearby. When it's next to energy and it's next to a free phosphate, it captures it in that third bond. And then when it's asked, and it doesn't even take much energy, someone just will tap it on the shoulder, hey, we need some energy. But sure, here. And release that free phosphate and utilize that. So it's like the $10 bill, it's the money of the cell, right? So it's utilized to capture energy at location A, bring it over to location B to drive that reaction. All right. Are we ready for unit three yet? Oh, we still have one more? Oh, no. <laughs> oh yeah, my Sorry, favorite guys. one, the sales. This one's going to be faster, though, because <laughs> hopefully. All right, again, auctioneer cell. It's an animal cell. How do we know? There's no chloroplast, there's no cell wall. There are specialty characteristics, though, like the microvilli here on the outside. These are going to be utilized for like the intestines, for the absorption across the lining. We also have microvilli that are found like in the trachea, et cetera. Um, here we have a flagellum. Flagellum is going to be used to propel a cell through liquid medium, think a sperm tail. We also have cilia. Cilia are going to be utilized to move things across um, a cell that is not moving, think like an egg being directed to its location. The difference between a plant and an animal cell is that the animal cells have the flagellum and the cilia, right? Um, it is a difference. It is not the main difference. Oh, okay. The main difference is chloroplasts, right? Can it photosynthesize? That's the big difference functionally. Can it make its own food? That may make it a heterotroph. Whereas, or sorry, an autotroph. Whereas we are heterotrophs because we have to get our energy from external sources. Um, but the second thing is that it doesn't have a cell wall. Like the plant cell would have a nice hard cell wall. And then the third thing is that animal cells can have, but don't all. Not all our cells have flagella. Not all our cells have cilia. Not all our cells have microvilli. And not a single cell has all three. So this is just showing you that these are secondary or special structures that they could have, okay. but that doesn't mean that they do, right? But again, the reason that we know for sure that it is not a plant cell is that there's no cell wall and there's no chloroplast, which would indicate that they were able to photosynthesize. On the test, do we have to tell the difference between a plant cell nope. and a... Nope, this okay. is human bio, not botany. Okay. Nope. All right, um, so... <laughs> well, it's anatomy, but you know what I mean. Um, okay, so here we're going to start with the nucleus. The nucleus is going to be the place within the cell that the DNA is going to be localized. Now normally, when you think of DNA, you think of chromosomes. We don't see chromosomes unless the cells are undergoing mitosis or meiosis. Most of the time, we're gonna see the cells, the, the DNA sprawled out all over the place. Remember the example I used of the library? How sometimes the library might be nice and pretty, so we could do a photo shoot, but at that time, you couldn't use any of the books. And what's the purpose of the library? To sprawl the books all over the place to get the information out of them, right? So normally, we're going to have our chromosomes unwound into chromatin all over the inside of that nucleus. Why? Because we are making copies of them in the form of making RNA. Right? I gave you the analogy of making a cherry pie, having the recipe book of all of the recipes in the entire planet, only needing one recipe, taking a Xerox of that one recipe or a screenshot of that one recipe being RNA, right? and taking that out of the nuclear pores to be able to drive protein synthesis, which happens at the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, right? We call that like the kitchen. Okay, so DNA inside the nucleus exits out, sorry, DNA stays in and makes RNA. RNA exits out of the nuclear pores, goes out to the site of protein synthesis, which is the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. We have some free ribosomes, but most of the ribosomes are gonna be found bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is found here. Um, this is all part of the endomembrane system. What do I mean by that? All of these membranes are connected. The nuclear membrane is connected to the rough ER, which is connected to the smooth ER, which is connected indirectly to the Golgi, which is connected indirectly to the plasma membrane, right? This is like saying, yes, I have a house and we have all these different rooms, but all the walls connect the entire house, right? So the endomembrane system is going to connect all the organelles, even though they're specialized in separate regions. All right, Whew. rough ER makes proteins, smooth ER makes lipids. 
All right, then once the proteins are created off of the rough ER, they're gonna get packaged by the Golgi apparatus. It's gonna give us little tags on it, equivalent to the postal service, saying which zip code we're headed to. So it's gonna say first you headed north, south, you headed east, west, what's your city, what's your neighborhood, what's your address, right? And eventually at the very far side of the Golgi apparatus, we're gonna release the membrane bound proteins for wherever their final site is, okay? So again, we have the major parts of the cell being the outside of the cell leading to the plasma membrane. Inside there, we're gonna have the cytosol, which is the fluid part, and the organelles that each have their own specific function. Um, other things of interest here, mitochondria, what do we do? Cellular respiration, right? We make energy for the cell, and it talks about how cool and how weird these guys are, and the fact that they're their own prokaryotic organisms with their own DNA and their own basic agenda that hide inside a membrane that says, hi, I'm the dog cell or Dr. Griffiths' cell or whatever, a membrane that is classified specifically for the organism that they're hiding in, as well as an internal membrane that has all their mitochondrial characteristics and their mitochondrial DNA. All right, what do they do? They make energy, so we leave them alone. All right, what are the rest of these guys? We have peroxisomes, proteasomes, um, lysosomes. These are different types of cellular trash cans and recycling machinery that are gonna help break down anything that needs to be degraded into its components that we can utilize before we eliminate anything else. Okay. Let's see, uh, we talked about the membrane. Membrane is basically gonna be a phospholipid bilayer that has isolating functions separating the outside from the inside and is semi-permeable. That means certain things can come in and other things cannot come in and that changes on the day to day based on what's inside the cell. So if the cell has enough of XYZ, it's not gonna bring any more in, but if it doesn't have enough, it will. This is the equivalent of deciding what you need from the grocery store before you go. And if you already have milk in the fridge, milk's not gonna come home. But if you don't have milk in the fridge, you're gonna bring milk in, right? And so that's how these, these nuclear pores are basically gonna be turned on or off to determine which groceries are allowed in or not. Now remember, each grocery has to go in through its own door. So this is the channel for milk, that'll be the channel for sugar, that'll be the channel for eggs, right? And they all are going to be dependent on what's called a concentration gradient. How much of the concentration of the ions are on the outside or the inside? So the membrane is the isolating function to make sure that we have a difference in concentration outside and inside and lets in whenever we want to let in and lets out whatever we want to let out. Special types of membrane proteins. These are uh, proteins that are peripheral proteins. They're found only on the outside or the inside. We also have transmembrane proteins, which are known as integral proteins. These are typically going to be channel proteins or carrier proteins that are going to be bringing things into or out of the cell. All right. Talked about that. Many different functions of proteins. This is like saying how many different blue collar workers are there. Way too many to count. But what are the general classifications of jobs is what we're going to talk about. So some of them can be ion channels that will let a particular ion in. Remember an ion is going to be a small biomolecule that is dissociated so it's going to have either positive or negative charge like sodium. Um, and it's going to be a specific pore that's going to only allow that particular. This is like a channel just for milk. So if you're bringing groceries in they each have to go in through their own door, right? Here's our carrier. Carrier is going to be a little bit different than a channel. A channel is like an open door. When it's open, people can go through it like an escalator. When it's on, you can go up it, right? As many people have been on it, been on it. But a carrier protein is more like an elevator. We have a limit of weight. There's only five of you that are allowed on. Then we go up and then we wait for the next one. So with the carrier, it's going to open, have a seat or a pocket that that molecule sits in, have a conformational change that allows it to go into the cell, and then switch back to bring the next one in. So it's going to have a rate limiting step. It can become saturated, right? Um, whereas ion channels cannot become saturated because really anything that, when it's open, it's open, when it's closed, it's closed. Now we also have receptors. Receptors are going to be integral proteins that go all the way through the membrane and they sit on the surface and they're waiting for a ligand. And that ligand is going to come along and cause a reaction that then sends an intracellular cascade. So the ligand doesn't come in, but it causes the inside of the cell to have some sort of change, right? Um, this is like a, a hormones that circulate through the body or uh, acetylcholine or norepinephrine that's going to have a nice surge through the body after a near miss incident, right? So it's going to bind to the outside of the cell but cause a change inside of the cell, like for example, if it's a heart cell, it'll increase the rate of the reaction or whatnot. We also have enzymes, we just talked about what they do, they increase the rate of a particular reaction. Usually they're found either on the outside or on the inside, so they're on one side or the other. Um, so they can be either integral, which means they go all the way through, but they usually have one face that's active, or peripheral. Um, we also have linker proteins. Linker proteins are structural, but they're a little bit more than structural. So although they are holding the inside to the outside of the different types of molecules, extracellular matrix molecules, cytoskeleton molecules that are holding it together, you also can picture that it's going to provide a meeting place for other enzymes and other biomolecules to do their thing. So just like the steps um, outside of the town hall 
do serve as an entrance point and an exit point to the city town hall. They also serve as an area where friends might meet for lunch. Someone might sit and read a book. Someone might feed the birds, right? It serves as a meeting point. So it's not just structural, it's also the Starbucks. It's also providing the, the support network or like the framework of the room to allow whatever it has to happen to get done. The enzymes or the other proteins to come on in and bind here. Um, and last but not least, we have cell identity markers. These are usually glycoproteins. They're gonna be on the surface of the cell and they're very specific. They don't just say, hi, I'm a dog cell or hi, I'm a human cell. They say, hi, I'm Dr. Griffiths' human heart cell, right? Really specific. And this is what we had to overcome when we were going to be transplanting the pig heart into the human and say that like I had anything to do with it. Um, but when scientists were able to do this, they had to eliminate all of the identifying markers on the outside that said, hi, I'm a pig heart. They had to do a bunch of other things too, but that was one of the major hurdles that they had to overcome was organ rejection, right? Why wouldn't the human body see it as a foreign organ and attempt to kill it in the terms of self versus non-self? Okay. Um, let's see. Membranes are selectively permeable. That means certain things can come through and other things cannot. And again, what comes in and what passes, what cannot pass, depends on the concentration of what's inside the outside of the cell. So only if we need milk are we going to bring milk in. If we have enough milk, we're not going to need to bring milk in. And this means that all of the cells are going to get the same amount of milk, or maybe not the same amount of milk, but the amount of milk that they need, right? If I don't need it, I'm not going to bring it in because the cell next to me might need it, right? And the cell next to me might need more milk than I do, and I might need more eggs. For example, a muscle cell needs a lot of mitochondria, whereas an eye cell needs to have, um, a, it gets its own energy, but it's going to need to have a lot of electrical impulses and going to be working on photons. So a little bit different, right? So depending on how specialized the cell is, they might need different growth rates, right? All right, so this whole thing works because we have a different concentration of XYZ, whatever it is, there's a different concentration in the bloodstream than there is in the extracellular fluid, than there is in the interstitial fluid. That's how we get groceries in, that's how we get trash out. We have more trash inside, it escapes, then we have more trash in the interstitial fluid, it escapes back into the bloodstream. Mm. By trash, I mean carbon dioxide and other biomolecules we're gonna get rid of in like the urine. And by nutrients, so milk, right? I obviously mean oxygen and other cellular metabolites that the cell needs. So this only works if we have a concentration gradient and things can move from one to the next. Otherwise, we have a complete stagnant system we don't have exchange if we all have the same things. So maintaining the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient, so we're not just having a concentration gradient of, ion, of molecules, we have a concentration gradient of ions, which means that we have some places that are a little more positive or a little more negative. And this is going to be called the electrochemical gradient. All right, so how do we transport substances across the plasma membrane? Some things are gonna be allowed to cross via channels um, or via diffusion, right? These are all passive processes. Basically, the question is, are we using cellular energy? And when we need to figure out if we're using cellular energy, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we going from a concentration of high to low or a concentration of low to high? This is the example where I was sitting in the boat in the middle of the class, bailing out the water, right? If you're in a boat with a hole in it, there's more water on the outside and less in the boat. And if you want the water to come in from high to low, no problem, sit back, read a book, boat will sink. But if you want the water out, you want to go from low and get it back into the high concentration, you're going to be bailing all day. Constant energy, right? And so this is one of those pumps that we utilize. The sodium potassium pump is a good example of this. We constantly want to pump sodium out and pump potassium in. Because we're constantly being flooded with sodium and we have too much, we never have enough potassium, so we want to bring it in. So we want to send sodium out and exchange, pull in potassium. This is the equivalent of like building your basement underneath sea level. You have to have your sump pumps on all the time or else water will flood in, right? So diffusion is going to be something where we're going from high concentration to low concentration. It's gonna be one of our active processes and it can be either regular diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Basically, are you able to go straight through the membrane on your own or do you need a carrier of some sort to do that for you? So if it's too polar or too highly charged to move through by simple diffusion, we can have a facilitated diffusion by either those channels that I talked about or the carriers that I talked about. But we're still not utilizing energy because we are still going from high concentration to low concentration, namely via passive processes, okay? So here's a potassium channel, right? So when the gate is open, the potassium is gonna go out. When the gate is closed, the potassium is gonna bounce off and not be able to go out. So again, a channel is either open or it's closed. And as many potassium molecules that go out while it's open, go out. And as many come in while, or whatever. 
So another good example, we'll talk about calcium channels. When we talk about nervous tissue, we're not there yet. That'll be many chapters from now. But we'll talk about calcium channels because calcium channels are going to end up flooding the muscle tissue after the nervous innervation says fire. And when the calcium floods the muscle tissue, it causes the contraction. And then the calcium gets pulled back out, causing the relaxation. But when it happens, they literally call it a flood of calcium because we just open the channels and it all pours in. There's no rate limiting step, right? When it's open, it's open, closed, it's closed. Whereas a carrier is going to be able to become saturated because there's only X amount of seats Paris glucose, only one or two at a time are going to sit. It's the equivalent of the elevator. You've got to wait for the elevator to go all the way down, drop off the people, and come back up, right? So we have to wait for the conformational change to deliver this glucose molecule, and then open back up to pick up the next glucose molecule. So it's a little bit different in that regard. But it's still going to be going from high concentration to low concentration, right? And here's a summary of that. Here's our concentration gradient. Well, how do we know that we have more here than there? It's depicted by three, no matter what it is. Three purple, one purple. Three white, one white. Three yellow, one yellow but they're gonna go through the membrane in different ways. So they're all going from high concentration to low concentration, but small molecules like water and ions can go right on through. This is when I said there was a city wall, but the city wall was made out of chain link fence. And so squirrels and birds could go right on through, right? Larger molecules are gonna have to go through the gates. They can do that either by channels, which are either open or closed, or by carriers, which are going to carry one at a time, right? It can go either by the escalator or the elevator, but they're still going from high to low, so it does not cost us cellular energy. All right, this is when we talked about tonicity. Tonicity refers to the concentration of solutes. End it again. All right, we needed a break anyway, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the poor people at home are probably like, ah. So is anyone watching right now? Go take a drink of water or something. Um, how do I get back to, I'm just going to minimize this. There we go. Hi everybody, welcome back. How about now? Hi, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> All right. Slideshow. Share screen. All right. I think we're back. There you go. Right here. Thank you so much. Peter. All right. So now we're talking about tonicity. Again, tonicity is referring to the concentration of solutes in solution. Um, so here we're going to have um, water, right? Water is going to be the only thing that's able to go across the membrane. So if we're looking at the solute concentration, what I want you to do immediately is flip it into the water concentration. So if I say it's 5% solute, I want you to hear 95% water. And that way when I say versus 100% water, you're going to immediately go, oh, from 100 to 95, right? So I want you to immediately think of the concentration of water, even though you're always going to be given the concentration of solute. So a 10% solution would be 90% water, right? All right, so what happens here, I'm going to make this number up, but let's say this is an 80% water in here, and this is 100% water, right? How do we make, you see we've got like say 20% of the solute in here, and I'm just kind of making it up, all right? So that means that we have 100% here, and 80% there, our concentration is going to, our gradient is going to go like this, right? Because remember, the solute can't come backwards, and the solute can't go across that barrier. Only the water can go across. So if the water is going to go across, it's going to try to flood in to make this zero or make this even, but it's never going to hit even because we're at 190. So no matter what, no matter how much goes in here, it's never going to hit 100. Right? Eventually, it might hit 99%, but it's never going to reach 100% water because there's solute present. So it's going to continue to push, and we can measure that draw, it's called the osmol osmolarity or like the osmotic pressure, osmotic pull, um, we can measure that pressure by applying pressure on this side until we reach equilibrium. And when the volumes are equal, we know the amount of weight that we put here is the amount of pressure that water is exerting across the membrane. This is really important because osmotic pull is what drives a lot of our cellular interactions, it what, what drives our liquid interactions between our bloodstream and our um, interstitial fluid and our cytoplasmic fluid. Right? So tonicity is really important. However, I do want to make a point here. When we give somebody an IV, do we give them an IV of water? No. Why not? Because that would do anything. Well, it would do something bad. Absolutely. Yeah. It would end up flooding the water into the cells, right? We just saw what happens if we give you 100% water. 
The water tries to reach equilibrium by flooding into the cell, but can't ever reach it, which is what happens here. It floods into the cell and reaches chemolysis. For those of you at home, that's in the bottom of this um, image uh, too. So the under hemolysis would be breaking the cell open and that would occur if it's in a hypotonic solution of almost pure water because the water is going to go across that membrane trying to reach equilibrium, it'll never reach it and it can burst this cell open. So a solution of pure water, the cell is gonna swell, it's a hypotonic solution. The swell is gonna, cell is gonna swell up like a hippo. So put it in hypotonic, swells up like a hippo. Put it in hypertonic, this is a low water concentration, high salts. So now we put it in, say, a 20% salt cross solution, right? And, and so there's more water inside the cell, because that's an 80% water solution, and we've got 95% water here. So the water is going to leave the cell and go into the hypertonic solution, trying to reach equilibrium. This is not good for the cell either. This is going to cause the cell to purge. So if the cell is in a hypertonic solution, it's going to purge all its fluid. If it's in a hypotonic solution, it's going to swell up. What do we want? Isotonic, isotonic is right in the middle. This does not mean we don't have water moving. It means we have the same amount of water moving in as out. So we have no net water moving. I wanna be really clear, there's always liquid moving. It's just how much movement is going in each direction. If more is going in than out, we're gonna swell up, not good. If more is going out than in, we're gonna shrivel, not good. This is why we hang a bag of potassium chloride, right? We don't hang a bag of water because we don't wanna lice the cells open. We don't hang a bag of 50% salt because we don't want the cells to shrivel. We hang a bag of isotonic saline solution that is the same concentration of salts as the rest of the body. It's also why they say if you're extremely dehydrated, you don't want to chug a glass of water. I mean, it's certainly better than chugging nothing, but what do you want to drink? An electrolyte solution, right? You want to restore your salt balance too, and you want to avoid this hemolysis. Um, what's that? No. Oh, all right. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> hypotonic, cells are going to undergo hemolysis, so like a hippo, hypertonic, they're going to undergo prenation and purge. All right, now it, that's all going to be under diffusion or passive processes that do not require any energy, okay? Facilitate diffusion and diffusion. Now we also have active processes. Active processes do require energy. This is bailing the water out of the boat. More water on the outside than in, but you still don't want that water coming in, so you're going to bail it out. It costs you energy constantly. So a good example of that is that sodium-potassium pump I was just talking about. We always have more sodium inside than we want. We always want to kick sodium out. We always have more potassium on the outside than we want to bring in. We never have enough potassium on the inside, basically. So we always want to bring the potassium in. We're hoarding it. We actually have more potassium on the inside, but we still we always want more. So we bring potassium in constantly and we pump sodium out constantly. And every time we pump sodium out, it costs us energy because we're going against the concentration gradient and then we're gonna bring potassium in. We're gonna expel three sodium and bring in two potassium. This is gonna contribute to that electrochemical gradient because we're expelling three positive and only bringing back in two positive, which means we're gonna have a slightly negative internal charge. This will become very important when we talk about nervous tissue. Okay, right now it's not that big of a deal, but when we talk about nervous tissue, the difference between the inside and the outside and electrical charge is gonna be how we transmit that electrical impulse. Okay, active transport is gonna be when we use energy from the ATP molecule to drive things against a concentration gradient. All right, now sometimes we can do this without utilizing cellular energy by getting a free ride on a door that's already opened. For example, in this case, sodium is always higher on the outside than the Inside, we're always pumping it out, right? So sodium's gonna flood in kind of on its own, and calcium at the same time is gonna take advantage of that and go the opposite direction. That's called an anti-porter. And basically, since the door's already open because we are going with the concentration gradient this direction, we slide in through it the opposite direction. This is the example of um, the girl at the door of the club saying, I'll go in only if you kick out my ex-husband. And this one is the girl at the door saying, I'll go in only if you let in my really ugly best friend, right? So this is sim porters that are going to be bringing in something with the concentration gradient, something that was already going to be going in, and then somebody hiding in along beside it that's going to be kind of drafting along it. And in this way, we can avoid utilizing energy to be able to bring these molecules in, even though they're going against their concentration gradient, right? So these are kind of sneaky ways that we can slip things in through the doors, if that makes sense. So again, antiporters, one's going in and one's going out slipstream. Sim porters, one's going in at the same time because, the, again, the door is open. So in this case, um, sodium is going with the gradient and glucose, which is going against the gradient, is gonna hitch a ride at the same time. 
All right, um, sometimes things are gonna have to go into the cell by vesicular mediated transport. That means that we're going to be entering by giant blebs of vesicles. We can have endocytosis where it comes into the cell, so entering the cell, exocytosis means exiting the cell, and transcytosis is when we're gonna go through one cell into the next. In the interest of time, I'm gonna go through the, I'm gonna skip most of that. So phagocytosis is a way that we're gonna ingest solid particles. It is a mechanism of endocytosis or ways that things are entering into the, bot, into the cell body. We also have pinocytosis, which is like cell sipping, taken in small amounts of the extracellular fluid into the cell. Um, these are both methods of, again, endocytosis, where things come into the cell. Exocytosis is when things are exiting the cell via vesicular transport. Again, a membrane and closed structure is gonna rise up to the surface, meet with the, the surface, open up and spill all of its contents to the outside. And sometimes things are coming into or out of the cell, not because they're gonna be utilized by that cell, but because they have to be utilized by the cell behind them. That's called transcytosis. So picture someone comes in through this wall to go through that wall. And whatever comes in here, it's just being transported through. We're not actually utilizing it for anything. Because not every cell is gonna be in direct contact with the blood supply. Some of them might be two or three layers away. Okay, inside the cell, we have a region called the cytosol. The cytosol is gonna be everything that is not the nucleus that is out inside the plasma membrane. It's gonna include the cytoplasm. Um, I'm sorry, the cytoplasm is gonna include the cytosol as well as all of the, the organelles. So the cytoplasm is everything inside there, all the jelly, the cytosol is the liquid in which the metabolic reactions occur. We're also gonna talk about the cytoskeleton. It's gonna be the structural network that's going to support the entire cell. But more than being the support network, we just talked about like the steps being like a meeting place as well. It's going to be the, the structure that provides a Starbucks for everyone to meet. We have specialty. Protein filaments, they're called microfilaments, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. These are all different parts of the cytoskeleton. Um, microfilaments are gonna be like actin or myosin. They're gonna allow for mechanical movement and mechanical support. Intermediate filaments are gonna be very strong. Microtubules are gonna be involved in cell division. They're also found in the flagella, the sperm tail, et cetera. Um, centrosomes are also involved in cell division. Centrosomes are going to go to opposite sides. They're going to create spindle fibers. The spindle fibers are going to meet at the chromosomes, which are now in a nice, pretty metaphase plate, meaning that they're all right in the center. And at the centromere, which is in the center of that X, the spindle fibers will meet and start pulling those apart. Those spindle fibers are going to be connected to the centrosomes, and the spindle fibers themselves are made of microtubules, which we just talked about. Uh, we talked about the between cilia and flagella earlier as well, so I'm gonna kind of, for the sake of time, rush through that a little bit. Ribosomes are specialty organelles that are the site of protein synthesis. They're small little spheres that have ribosomal RNA. We have a large and a small ribosomal subunit with an mRNA molecule that runs through the middle of it that's going to be read three at a time, so three nucleotides at a time, or codon is going to code for one amino acid, and that's gonna be how we create proteins. And we do that on the rough ER. So we have the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER is where we're going to find the ribosome. The smooth ER, we're not gonna see any ribosomes. Literally, we just saw them. There should be an image here. But literally, we just saw it underneath the microscope, whether or not we had them present. Okay. Um, ER is responsible for transporting substances like newly synthesized molecules through the Golgi apparatus. So we're gonna synthesize the packaging material, which is the vesicles, or like the membranes and lipids that are gonna create the membrane to be able to bring them to the Golgi apparatus. ER is also gonna serve as a role of detoxification within the cell, where it's gonna be able to um, help detoxify any chemicals and get them outside of the cell. And also it's gonna be responsible for the release of calcium ions when we are involved in muscle contraction. So that's gonna be the sarcoplasm for reticulum, and that's a specialty type of ER that contains the calcium ions, which sometimes will open the floodgates when we get a signal from the nerve to cause contraction. All right, talk about the Golgi apparatus being like a giant mail room. It's basically going to have many stacks of membranes. I'm sorry, we don't have the image here. I'm sure it's on your image online. Um, so we have multiple different stacks. They're called cisterns. And as we go from one face to the very external face, we're gonna get more and more detailed like RFID tags on the proteins that tell us what they're going to do. And eventually, as we exit off of the Golgi apparatus, we're gonna have a vesicle that has a bunch of proteins that are destined for the same destination, whether they're gonna to go to the plasma membrane, to the lysosome, secretory vesicle, etc. cetera. Um, these are all cellular trash cans, lysosomes, peroxisomes, proteasomes. These are different types of cellular recycling and cellular trash cans, whereby we can digest anything that we have brought into the cell, whether it be 
um, a microbe that we just ingested, etc. And once we, or in, internal <coughs> organelles that are falling apart, or misfolded proteins, they would go to the proteasome. Basically, the way you would sort your trash in all the different trash cans, these are different vesicles within the cell that are responsible for degrading and recycling the different biomolecules. Okay, and then when it's all done, it goes to the peroxisome. Peroxisomes are going to have oxides or peroxide in there, hydrogen peroxide, that's going to help digest anything left over. You can consider this the incinerator. After the lysosome and the proteasomes have taken their fill, then everything that's actually trash that we're not able to use will get degraded via hydrogen peroxide before it gets spewed back out into the extracellular matrix, right? So that's considered kind of like incineration. Okay, mitochondria, we talked about these guys. These are going to create energy for the cell. It's a prokaryotic organism that was ingested a long time ago. It's the endosymbiont hypothesis, and basically they hide inside our cells, have an external membrane that looks like our cells, and an internal membrane that's specific to them. They create energy, and they have their own DNA, so they self-replicate, and um, they travel throughout our body. We found them in our bloodstream, in our fat cells. They're in every cell in our body. We're not sure exactly why, but we know that the mitochondria don't stay put. So the mitochondria that was found in this cell can sometimes be found far, far away in different cells of the body because we've been able to tag them and watch them move. We don't really know what they do, um, but they do provide us energy, so we leave them alone and they leave us alone, and they are found in every eukaryotic organism. It's not just us. It's dogs, it's rats, it's pigs. It's every single eukaryotic organism have these mitochondria in them, including plants, etc. cetera. Um, why? Because they give us aerobic respiration, and so they're gonna give us more bang for our buck, almost tenfold for each glucose molecule. So it's a really huge leap evolutionarily for being able to metabolize glucose. All right, so the nucleus is gonna be the part of the cell that we consider the boss's office. It's a very prominent feature of the cell where it's going to have a region called the nucleolus. That's the site of ribosome assembly. The other main thing that happens in the nucleus is we are going to create RNA, right? Um, so we're also going to have a nuclear envelope, which has special two nuclear pores. They look like those little poi donuts, and that's where the RNA is going to escape out um, from those nuclear pores into the cytoplasm. Again, the nucleoli, where we're going to create ribosomes. Um, let's see. Now we're talking about chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 chromosomal pairs. 22 of them are autosomes. One of them is a sex chromosome, right? Ladies, we have two Xs, gentlemen, an X and a Y. Um, each of these different chromosomes are going to have a long amount of of genetic material, so it's going to have a ton of different genes on them, and um, we normally have it free in what we call chromatin, but it is sometimes condensed down into what we call a chromosome during cellular division. Okay, so how are we making proteins? Protein synthesis is going to happen with transcription. If I don't have an image, it's just going to be difficult. This is going to be difficult. Do you um, want to see it on this? I mean, I can see it. I, I can see it on my head. Can oh, you guys okay. see it? Yeah. As long as you can see it on your screen, I guess, but those of you with it, it's going to be difficult. All right, so transcription is basically when we're going to take the, the base pairs of the DNA and turn it into a copy, which would be the base pairs of the RNA, okay? And that's going to happen in the nucleus. So transcription is using the language of nucleic acids, DNA into the nucleic acids of RNA, and then we're going to have translation occurring into the actual cytoplasm. Okay, so we use the DNA as a template for a synthesis of mRNA, but also for the synthesis of ribosomal RNA um, and transfer RNA, all of which are going to be utilized for protein synthesis. So as we're transcribing DNA, we're basically going to be unwinding the DNA using um, a particular enzyme that's called RNA polymerase. So it's going to unwind the DNA and then read pieces of the DNA and give a exact opposite. So if it sees an A, it'll put in a U. If it sees a C, it'll put in a G, etc. Uh, from the DNA transcript to make the RNA. So again, RNA polymerase makes an RNA polymer. Anytime you see ACE, you know you're dealing with enzyme, and it's probably pretty descriptive about what that enzyme does. So you can pretty much guess by removing the ACE that it makes an RNA polymer. Um, then we're going to have some intron exon splicings. We're going to cut out the commercials, basically, and then we're going to have that leave the nucleus, enter into the cytoplasm, find a ribosome, and start translation. Translation is when we are making the protein from the RNA. So the first thing that has to happen, we're going to have the messenger RNA transcript leave the nuclear pores and associate with the ribosome. As you may recall, the example that I've given here is that we're making an apple pie or a cherry pie or whatever, and the DNA is the recipe book of all the recipes. And the recipe that you need is just the apple pie. We made just a Xerox of that. That's the RNA. The Xerox is allowed to leave the library and go to the kitchen. The kitchen is the endoplasmic reticulum where the ribosomes are found. The ribosomes are the cooks. Ribosomes don't know what they're making, and so they're given specific instructions. 
that instructions comes in the form of mRNA. So we have a small subunit and a large subunit that are going to clamp on either side of that mRNA molecule. And inside there, we're going to have three seats. We're going to have the A seat, the P seat, and the E seat. A stands for, I don't know what it stands for, I use it for access. It's the first point, right? The second is P for peptide bond, I know that, and E for exit. So A is where we're coming in. And what happens, basically, we are going to use the example where we're all a bunch of um, individuals that are carrying balloons, and we carry different color balloons based on what our feet say. Our feet are the antipodons that match up the photons. And we're going to then run and try to get into this A site. Only one of us is going to fit. Whoever fits is going to end up sitting in that site, get shuffled over to the P site, holding their balloon. That's the peptide bond site there at the P site. Now the next one's going to come in, and whoever comes in next is going to, the person who brought the first balloon in is going to transfer it over, and then they're going to leave, and the person in the A site goes to the P site. The person in the P site just exits out the E site. And it's going to allow the rinse repeat as we get this long, growing chain of balloons until eventually we hit a stop codon. That stop codon is going to be three nucleic acids that are going to code for a tRNA that does not carry an amino acid. So it's going to come in, and instead of transferring the amino acid over to the growing polypeptide chain, it's going to terminate synthesis, and the whole thing's going to fall apart. And we're going to make another cherry pie immediately after from the same recipe. So we can utilize that recipe many, many different times in the kitchen until it degrades. So that RNA molecule is not just going to be used to make one protein, it's going to be utilized to make multiple different sets of that particular protein. But again, we're always making the same cherry pie from the transcript, right? We're only able to make one thing from that recipe. Okay, so sorry, I had to do that without images. Um, okay, so cellular division is basically how we reproduce ourselves. We have two major types, mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is for cellular differentiation, growth, and repair. Anytime you cut yourself, you're healing yourself by mitosis, which is regular, um, regular cell division. And then we also have sexual cell division, so specialized cell division that makes gametes, namely sperm and egg. These are haploid cells. The haploid cells are meant to meet up with another haploid <coughs> cell to restore the full genetic complement, which makes a completely genetically unique offspring from both the parents or of the other, um, the other children. Okay, so let's talk about cell division. So we have mitosis and meiosis. I think we're going to do meiosis first, or mitosis first. Okay, so mitosis, when you think about mitosis, you think about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And everybody always forgets interphase, which is like the time frame that you're not reproducing and you're getting ready to reproduce. So one of the first things that we have to do during interphase is grow. So we have G1, which is growth phase one, then we have synthesis when we synthesize our DNA, and then G phase two. During G phase one, we're gonna create more cytoplasm, our cellular organelles are gonna start dividing. Um, and then during S phase, we're gonna synthesize all of our DNA. After this, we're gonna have a stop point, and that stop point's gonna say, was your DNA faithfully replicated? And if the answer is no, there's no turning back. You have double the amount of DNA, but you can't go forward either, so you're gonna enter, enter into apoptosis or be pro uh, programmed cell death. But if the answer is yes, your DNA is faithfully replicated, everything is fine, you're gonna enter into G2, you're gonna start more growth and get ready to enter into mitosis. Okay, the actual mitosis steps, again, are gonna be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase is when we are setting the stage. So prophase is when we're getting all the actors and all the characters together. So we're going to start breaking down our nuclear envelope. We don't need it. We were condensed down into chromosomes, and we need to pull our chromosomes to the opposite side. So we're going to break down our nuclear envelope, and we're going to start getting all our chromosomes aligned in the metaphase plate. Once all of our, and our spindle fibers are going to be coming from our centrioles, so here's our chromosome with like a nice X. In the middle, we have a centromere right here, and the kinetic force centromere is going to be um, the region where the centrioles and the spindle fibers are going to attach and then pull those two, so it starts off as an X, which is really two eyes, but they're connected, into the separate eyes to go to opposite sides, all right? So as the curtain lifts, the curtain of the play is gonna lift on the metaphase spread, where all the actors are in alignment, all of our chromosomes are in our pretty little X's in a straight metaphase plate in the middle. We have two sets of centrioles, which have spindle fibers that are connected to each set of the X's. And we're gonna pause here for a minute, because we wanna double check that everything is in order. This is the equivalent of the amusement park ride attendant going around and checking everybody's seatbelt before the ride starts. Yeah, we all know you use a seatbelt on the way over here. We know you know how to use a seatbelt. We know we told you to put it on. But we're going to check and make sure it's on anyway because we want to make sure that all goes right because it's too late when the ride is in motion to fix the seatbelt, right? It's the same thing with the metaphase plate. If something's not connected properly, we want to make sure that it is connected properly before we hit anaphase. Anaphase is when we're actually pulling those X's apart. Once that starts to happen, if that X doesn't get pulled apart and both go to one side, we get duplicate on this side and none on that side, both cells are going to end up dead. Because this one's going to have an extra chromosome, that one's going to miss a chromosome, and they're both going to end up with either too much or not enough information. So we need to make sure everybody is buckled in before the ride starts. 
right? So there's a hole there at the metaphase plate, which when you're looking at things underneath the microscope, you get to see several of them in metaphase because metaphase takes a little bit longer than the others because of all the checkpoints. Once we get an anaphase, we're pulling to the opposite sides, and as we do, so here I'm a, sp I'm a spindle fiber over here, actually I'm a centriole connected to the spindle fibers. Remember the spindle fibers are also connected to the chromosomes over there. So I'm gonna be pulling in my spindle fiber, but basically every time I pull it in, I cleave it off. So I pull it, cleave it, pull it, cleave it, pull it, cleave it. So I'm breaking it down and pulling the chromosomes closer and closer until I have all the chromosomes over here on my side and all these other chromosomes over here on that side. That's the end of anaphase, now we're heading to telophase. During telophase, we're gonna restore our nuclear envelope. Our chromosomes are going to start unwinding back into chromatin so they can start being utilized to create RNA. And we're going to have cytokinesis happen. So telophase and cytokinesis are like walking out the door and having the door shut behind you. Yeah, they happen in a particular order, but they happen at the same time. Cytokinesis happens at the very end of telophase, like clockwork. Basically what happens is we're going to start out with a nice long oval-shaped cell, picture like a zero. And then we're going to start tightening the belt, making it an eight, until they eventually make it two O's. Right, then we pull it into two separate pieces. So that's what happens during telophase. So now I get to go forward a couple, I assume. Yeah, all right. So we have several different t destinies of our cell. I guess it's for all of us, right? You can either continue alive and function without dividing. That's going into G0. So I forgot to mention that after you come out of, um, after you come out of telophase, you just become a new cell essentially, cytokinesis. You have a time frame where you enter into what's called G0 a senescent time frame where you're not responsible for doing anything except living, right? And some cells stay in G0 forever. Some cells are never gonna divide again. They're gonna enter into what's called cellular senescence, which is basically old age. You won't be making new cells, you won't be dying either, but you'll just be maintaining. So that's one of the three fates of the cell to remain alive and functioning. Another one is to continue to grow and divide, and ultimately, of course, the third is for death, cell death, okay? Um, there's two different types of cell death. If you chop off your finger and let it rot on the table, that's necrosis, right? You don't utilize any of the energy from that cells. Those are all just dead cells and rotten meat. But if we want to undergo controlled cell death, it's called apoptosis, and I'm targeting a cell for death, so you're a cell that's been targeted for death, we're going to completely disassemble you, like take your whole house apart, and all your neighbors are going to absorb all of the roof and all of the shingles and all of the windows. We're not going to let all of your cellular products go to waste. We put a lot of energy into building that cell, or the body did. So we're going to be taking apart the cell in a particular fashion that it can get distributed to all of the neighboring cells, not just rot on the table, which is necrosis. Okay? Is that like gangrene? No, yeah. Sure. Gangrene, frostbite. Sure, absolutely. Uh, diabetic sores, right? Anytime the cell is going to be cut off from its external environment and food source, it can end up damaged like that. Um, okay. We're almost there, guys. So this, I think we got it in the next 10 minutes. All right. So my reproduction is going to be meiosis. So previously we talked about mitosis. We had one cell replication and one cell division. So if we double and then cut in half, we get back to where we started, right? But with meiosis, we have one cell division and two, di I'm sorry, one cell replication and two rounds of division. So picture we double and then we cut in half and then we cut in half. Now we end up with half of where we started, right? So we start with two, we end up with four, then back down to two, then back down to one. So we end up with half boy cells. Basically, so I just told you we had 23 chromosomal pairs, right? We have 22 autosomes, that makes 44, and then we have two sex chromosomes, that makes 46. In a haploid cell, we only have 23. We have one copy of chromosome one, one copy of chromosome two, one copy of chromosome three, all the way through 22, and either an X or a Y, just one, right? Now, side note, women, all of those eggs are all gonna have an X. There's nothing that we can create that has any Y, right? So all of our eggs, because we're XX, no matter what, our eggs are gonna have an X. Gentlemen, you guys are XY. You have a 50% chance of creating an X bearing sperm or a Y bearing sperm. So Henry VIII, who killed however many dozen wives because they kept giving him girls, well, that was his sperm that was unable to create the male offspring. Off with her head, right? Um, so anyway, the point being that the males are able to determine either the X or the Y. And also, interestingly, I'm on a side note, I know you hate it, but we're able to separate out X bearing sperm and Y bearing sperm by weight. The Y is a smaller chromosome than the X. The X is heavier than the Y, and it's slight to slight difference, but when we spin the sperm down at really high speeds, we can draw sperm off the bottom or off the top and have a different percentage chance of having a male or a female because the X-bearing sperm will go to the bottom and the Y-bearing sperm will go to the top. So we have a chance of skewing, if we wanted to skew our results for IVF, for example, so that we had a lot more males or a lot more females to pick from, 
we could do that. All right, I'm off topic. Um, anyway, meiosis is basically going to be the result of one division or one multiplication and two division events. The cool thing that happens at meiosis one that does not happen during mitosis is something called crossing over. So before we split up, the male and the female, um, okay, not the, really it's going to be the grandparents of the egg that we're creating, right? So my, if I'm creating an egg, I'm going to cross over my maternal and my paternal homologs and have a crossing over event that's going to end up with a completely genetically unique chromosome before it gets passed on to the egg. So we're going to shuffle all of our grandparents' genes before we deal the hands that the egg and the sperm are dealt. Okay? So we're going to enter into all the same things. Prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, but during telophase one, even though we have cytokinesis happening, we might not have the nuclear envelope reforming. Why bother? We're gonna head right into meiosis two, where we go with prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two. At the end of this, we're going to end up with haploid cells that are genetically unique. So with mitosis, we end up with two genetically identical cells that have the same information as the parents that are diploid. With meiosis, we end up with four genetically unique haploid cells that are waiting to reconstitute their genetic makeup by interacting with another diploid cell, right, the sperm and the egg, to restore the genetic complement to create a genetically unique individual. Okay. Oh, we're almost there, guys. Just a little bit. Um, all right. So not all cells are going to look alike. Why not? Um, because they're going to have special specialty functions and form defines function. So some cells are going to be really long, like neuron cells. Some cells are going to be really tight and condensed. Some cells are going to have tight junctions, like the bladder, that are not going to allow for leakage. Or specialty parts of the cell, like contraction out of cells, right? So the cells are going to look very different. We also have red blood cells, I think, in here. That's going to be anuclear. Um, so the shape of the cell is going to vary considerably, and because form defines function, the function of the cells are going to vary considerably. And then the last one here is just cells and aging. Oh, now I get the picture? <laughs> anyway, um, and cells and aging. So basically, as we get older, we can end up with uh, issues in physiology. I'm just going to skip it. I think we're done, right? Yeah, I think we're finished here. Do you guys have any questions on anything? No. No, I know that was a lot, guys. I know. God. All right, you guys at home. Thanks so much for showing up. Thank you. Bye.